Poetic words from the coach, Ken Purcell, as we head into the final day of the most unusual season in high school football history. From AT&T Stadium in Arlington, the Katy Tigers know their way to state. They've won eight state championships. They're looking for their ninth state title as they roar up I-45 from the greater Houston area, getting ready to take on the Cedar Hill Longhorns, a team they faced three times in the past. The Longhorns all fired up for this one today. We welcome you to our coverage of the UIL 6A Division II State Football Championship, the Cedar Hill Longhorns against the KD Tigers. I'm Craig Way, pleased to be joined by the former Crowley Eagle and two-time Super Bowl champion Gary Reasons. That'll get you fired up when you see guys jumping up and down like that. Oh, it, it certainly does. Brings back a lot of memories for me being playing high school football here in the state of Texas. There's nothing else like it. And we got a couple of teams out here, Craig, that I think are poised and ready to play. We're going to see some contrasting styles on offense, but a lot of talent on display tonight. Starting off with Cedar Hill's quarterback, Caden Salter, bound for the University of Tennessee. He is a guy who not only makes them go, he is electric. Well, he really is electric, and he is a dual-threat quarterback. His numbers on the season and his career have been tremendous for this football program. So Caden Salter, he is what makes this offense go when you talk about the Longhorns from Cedar Hill. He does a great job with his eyes, I think, in the game of what he does. So when we take a look at his play on the field, it is really exceptional, Craig, because what he's able to do is kind of create on the fly. When he sees things happening and de developing in front of him, he has the ability to make somebody move with his body, and then he can a shift and change as he sees things develop down the field and then throw an accurate football. He's done a great job of delivering this season through five different receivers, roughly around 500 yards in production to those five players. So he's going to spread the ball around today. It's going to be fun to watch Caden Salter. Well, Cedar Hill has Caden Salter and an explosive weapon that Katie also has an explosive offense, but they do it different. Don't the Tigers always do? And they do it on the ground, and they've got two outstanding running backs to do it. Well, they've got a couple of brothers back there, and there's no doubt about that. The Davis brothers have done a great job of running the football for this program. Combined, this duo of brothers, a senior and a sophomore, over 3,000 yards rushing for the Tigers, and they do get it done. Jalen is a little bit of a bigger one. He's going to be the senior running back, and he's more powerful, and he does a good job of getting tough yardage for this football ball team but then when you want the lightning you're going to give it to the younger brother and that's going to be what he does best and so these two running backs and the brothers Seth does a nice job of speed and he has the cut cutting ability and the jump cut that you like in a tailback so we've got a couple of explosive runners Katie gets it done on the ground in the play action passing game as I said it's a contrast of styles for these two offenses. Might be interesting to see which defense can come up with the key stop or two. We've got the kickoff coming up for the 6A Division II State Championship. Katie and Cedar Hill coming up next. Might as well get your popcorn ready. Get it ready for the Cedar Hill Longhorns preparing to take on the Katie Tigers in the UIL's 6A Division II State Football Championship. KD, the visiting team, as they take the field. It's time to check in with our reporters who are right there with these teams today. We start off on the KD sideline with our Lauren Blackwell. Thanks, Craig. Well, with the program's ninth state title on the line, Katie head coach Gary Joseph said in order to be successful offensively, his team needs to control the tempo, move the chains, and put points on the board. Sounds like an easy task for a team that's outscored its opponents 114 to 21 in its last two games. Leading the charge on the Tiger offense, the brother running back duo of Jalen and Seth Davis, often referred to as Thunder and Lightning. The pair has combined for over 3,000 rushing yards on this season. The KD defense will have its challenge though this afternoon containing Cedar Hill quarterback Caden Salter. If the Tiger run game performs and defense limits Cedar Hill, they'll be on the way to that ninth state title. Now let's send it over to my friend Katie Engelson on the Cedar Hill sideline. Thank you, Lauren. Cedar Hill head coach Carlos Lynn told me the expectation for his team this season is the same as it's always been. They begin with the end in mind, and that is winning a state title. Today they face a familiar foe in the Katy Tigers, as this is the fourth meeting in the last decade between these two teams in the state championship game. Coach Lynn says if they want to have success offensively, they have got to protect the football. Ball security is key. Defensively, they have got to shut down Katie's rushing attack, just as they did last week to Denton Geyer. Craig? Katie, thank you. 
And it will be Katie High School kicking off. The Tigers won the toss, elected to defer the option in the second half. So the Tigers ready themselves to kick off. And Nemanja Lasik to kick it off. And the Longhorns back deep to receive it. It's a little pop-up kick, a shorter kick, and a fair catch called for and made just shy of the 25-yard line. And that is where the Longhorns get the football first. And Caden Salter will lead Cedar Hill's attack onto the field to get a look at this. And we get a look at the Ford Impact players, Gary Reasons, for today's game. For on both sides. Well, when you look at JV and Clemmer for the offense here for, for Cedar Hill, there's no doubt about it. He's going to be one of the featured receivers, and he's done a great job of stretching the field and being a great target for, for his quarterback. And defensively, Kanya, the middle linebacker, has been exceptional around the, the football. Look for him to be in the action quite a bit today. Here we go. Out of an empty set, Salter to take the first down snap. And to the air immediately. Breaking, stepping out of a tackle and going upfield is Clemmer. Right away, the Ford Impact player on the catch and run for 15 yards. That's exactly right. This is what they do. They have this movement. They find a way to exploit the defense, get an easy throw and catch here for this offense to get jump started. So out at the 39-yard line. Official total was 13 on the catch. And the run out to the 39. And now the first run for Salter. Outside, a stiff arm. And Another first down, this one in the Tiger territory, a 12-yard run for Caden Salter. Well, for Caden Salter, it's all math. He's got four receivers to his left, and he knows the defense is out here, and he can outman them with his feet, essentially, by running around the edge. He does a great job, especially with the stiff arm here, just to get some extra yardage. And I like the ability of this young man to orchestrate on the fly when he sees the defense and how they deploy. So two plays, two first downs for Caden. Chris Allen in the backfield, offset to the lower side of your screen, to the right of Salter, who looks to run again. The side run this time, but the Tiger defense adjusts quickly and limits the gain only to a yard. And a nice first down play made on the tackle came coming in from Jaden Marowan. Yeah, you've got a bunch here on defense for this KD Tiger defense. They've done a great job up front all season long, and they're going to try to contain this, this running game from the quarterback with three to four defensive linemen. They'll have the linebackers around them as well, but it's going to be a task here to handle uh, Salter. And there's the pressure right there. A short hop pass incomplete. The blitz coming for KD. Carson Marshall, the outside linebacker, brought the heat there, and this is really what Katie's trying to defend here when you're looking at those impressive numbers for Caden Salter, over 65% completion percentage and over 1,000 passing yards, over 550 rushing yards, averaging six yards per catch. has only thrown two interceptions and has scored five rushing touchdowns. So definitely the action figure for Cedar Hill on third down and nine. Both for the middle and drop. Would have been a first down, but unable to come up with a catch. Brian Rainey in position to do it, couldn't do it, and Cedar Hill will punt. Well, he's their number one receiver as far as total catches on the season. Rainey is, and this is one where he's got his eyes turning after the catch here immediately. He turns just a little bit too quick there before he pulls that ball in, and that would have been a big first down there for this drive to continue for the, for the Longhorns, but it uh, winds up being a, a punting situation. Jake Carroll to punt it. Antonio Silva and Ronnie Schneider back deep for Katie. High snap, and that kick is away, and kicking away from the returners takes a nice Cedar Hill bounce. A very nice one. And a roll all the way down to the three-yard line. Tremendous punt there, angling away 44 yards without a return. So, Katie to go to the tack, and it's a sophomore quarterback, Caleb Coker, who leads them and he fits that description of outstanding student of the game yeah. and uh, game manager and all those kinds of things. Runs the offense very well. You know, the thing that I'm I'm impressed with about him is he is, you know, he's a young player, a sophomore. He's coming in onto a program that has a lot of tenure and a lot of expectations. But as a sophomore here in the state championship game, the biggest stage, let's see how he performs and handles this big moment. 
Maybe operating out of the eye of the first down toss to Jalen Davis. Davis able to break through. Nice first down run, nearly a first down on the run, a gain of nine. As we look at the Ford Impact players on this side of the football. Well, the Impact guys, there's no doubt about it. They're going to be all over the place here for both of these football teams. We're going to take a look at Tyler Sol Salisbury on the offense as a wide receiver, and he's going to be able to be around the football. He's going to catch the football. He'll stretch the field with, with, with uh, Caleb Coger throwing the ball football to him, and Jaheim Lowe is the tackling machine as well defensively. Look for him to kind of try to stick things in the middle there to try to slow down that powerful running attack. Second down of the yard for the Tigers after the nine-yard run for Davis. And this time pounding ahead and enough for the first down to Jalen Davis, the elder of the two Davis brothers. Harvey Dyson, the junior defensive end on the stop for Cedar Hill, but it's a move of the chain to the first down for Katie. Well, there's, there's nothing new for this Katie Tiger offense, and it's been going on for years and years and years with this offense under Gary Joseph and Gerald Brixley, the offensive coordinator. You know, they, they talk all about this program as a multi-style pro offense, but it's run first, run heavy, and they're going to make their yardage on the ground in play action passing. So the run game sets up the play action game, which I'm sure we'll see today. Yeah, here's an example of them, the extra tight ends in the ball game and back to the ground as blockers as Davis on the carry for a couple. Charles Esters the third on the tackle. Yeah, if you're if you're a fan of pro style fun <laughs> power football, you're gonna like Katie Tiger football because that's exactly what this is all about. And being able to outpower, outnumber in the, in the run game, you're trying to utilize your blocking schemes to help give your your backs just a little bit of an edge for them to cut through, and that's what they do. The Hall of Fame coach Gary Joseph, you saw him there, his 17th season as the head coach at Katie High, 226 career coaching victories. Now over to the air and caught by the younger of the two Davis. Actually, that's Isaiah Smith out of the backfield, the fullback with a catch, but only a three-yard catch because Amarian Williams, the corner, brought him down. When we talked to Coach uh, Coach Joseph, I asked him specifically about Ke Caleb Coger. What is his best attribute? He, he absolutely said play-action pass. And so well, you see the play-action fake here, and when he drops that ball out there, pretty accurate on that, he knows how to make those play fakes and throw accurately on the run. That's what you want with a play-action passing quarterback. First third down situation for the KD offense. Fullback Isaiah Smith. The tailback is Jalen Davis on third down and three. It's Jalen Davis. First down and more. Up to the 30-yard line for a gain of six. Well, on the left side of the line there, Gary. Yeah, a lot of heavy Jalen Davis here early in this ball game. The bigger the senior runner, he's getting the nod here to start this ball game. But I'm sure we're going to see Seth Davis give him a spell here early on. But the combination of those two running backs, Craig, both of them combining for over 3,000 production yards. It talks about a few things. One, the running style of this offense, the offensive line and what they have done all season long. But really, guys, that just get it, and they understand what KD football is all about. Koger off play action to throw in trouble trying to get rid of it that'll be intentional grounding the Longhorn defense Jaheim Lowe we mentioned him as a Ford impact player with some help from Joey Johnson an extra linebacker and we're all over the sophomore well this is several levers of play fake here they got one going across and then he's trying to buy a little more time here but unfortunately the defense just closes on him too fast and Lowe does a nice job of tackling there and getting to the quarterback causing this uh this penalty here, I believe, on the quarterback. Here's Lance Mathis, our referee from this Tyler base chapter. Digital grounding. Offense, number 10. That's a spot foul. We'll also down. It's second down. Another one of these outstanding officiating crews working a state championship. Lance Mathis, the referee. Toby Rackley, the umpire. Ron Daniels, the head linesman. Brad Frisbee, the line judge. Jackie Culverhouse, the back judge. Scotty Allen, the field judge. Buddy Furquan is the side judge. And Alvin Bowright. Now, this is not what KD wants to be, Craig. This is definitely what you would call behind the chains here. Second down and 25. Line up with two receivers out this time and back to the ground. And Cedar Hill ready for Jalen Davis. That time limiting the game as Davis was surging forward, but only a pickup of a couple. Again, Harvey Dyson from that defensive end spot, Gary, already making his presence felt. Yeah, Dyson's one of those guys that he's going to be in there. Look for Charles Esters, the, you know, the third, number 32, to be an impact player also on this defensive front here. They're the ones that are going to have put speed and effort on the on this quarterback as he's throwing the ball. And this is not a situation that, that Gary Joseph is comfortable with with this offense and this young quarterback. On third and 22, and a false start's going to make it third and 27.
Yeah, false start called there by the official, not getting his microphone on just yet. But, uh, well, this is a good opportunity for this Cedar Hill Longhorn defense to really kind of bow up and just kind of get a great stop here on this first series of downs here. Actually, they've made yardage, it seems like, in just the last couple of plays here with the penalties. But overall, this is a chance to get off the field, get your offense back out there, and, and get things settled down here for them at, as they start this football game. And it turns third and 22, as we mentioned, in the third down and 27. Back to the ground, though, plenty of running room outside, a stiff arm, and this is Seth Davis on third down and 27. It's going to be just short of the first down. He picked up 24 there. Well, they forgot to step up in the hole. That's exactly what happened. You have a draw play here with a good lead block from the fullback, and they do a good job of giving him space, and then Seth Davis showing you why he's the one-two punch here. And kind of just the, the quicker of the two running backs, perhaps he and his brother, but almost grabbed, got that first down, fourth and a couple here, and Katie's electing to punt the ball here on fourth down. Right, Gary Joseph may have pondered it for a moment, but decided just good field position to go ahead and punt the football. Yeah, but gets him out of a big hole, Craig. That was a huge play. There could be a good, good opportunity to get the field position Time out. advantage. Cedar Hill. That's their first of the half. Well, the, the Tigers were not, or, or excuse me, the Longhorns were not convinced that the Tigers were going to punt. Carlos Lynn checking this with his crew. This will be a media timeout. Robotics when he was at Crowley High had <laughs> oh, it existed yeah, yeah. back then. Yeah, that would definitely have been exactly where I would be. You bet. So the uh, Tigers to punt. And Fuller shirts to kick it. It is away. It's a high kick, not real deep. And in fact, it'll kick back up field. So they'll go back for good field position for Cedar Hill for the Longhorn second possession of this football game, early feeling out moments of this game. Of course, Cedar Hill with a short bus ride here. Here to Arlington. Yeah, 25 miles max there from Southwest Dallas County over here to Arlington. Been around a long time, and of course, Joey McGuire, the coaching legend, and coached those three epic games between these two teams in 2012, 2013, and 2014. Coach McGuire now on the Baylor University staff as an associate head coach. First down, catch and run, and big run off the nice spin upfield, and a first down for Cedar Hill, and that's Kylan Ashton. 14 yards. Well, you know, Jaden Salter didn't have to throw. Jaden Salter didn't have to throw this ball very far. He just moves to his left. Watch the block here to get his lead block right there, and it just explodes up in the hole and gets some extra yardage. So, good job of getting things started out there by uh, Caden Salter and on the quick pass. Kick to Ashton. This time over the middle of the catchway. That ball is loose on the turf. It's been ruled a fumble, and Katie comes up with it. Hamilton McMartin, the strong safety, comes away with it. We'll see what the ruling is. Remember, there is replay review in the state championship games, but yeah. we'll hear the announcement after the confirmation. Well, catch and fumble on the field, I think, is the play here that has been called on the field. We'll take a quick look at it here with our camera. There's the catch, football move. He pulls it in. I think that's a catch and a fumble. It's a good hit there by the defensive player knocking that football out. That was Dalton Johnson causing that the ruling fumble. on the field. Is a catch and a fumble by the offense, recovered by the defense. The previous play is under further review. Clearly, Carlos Lynn in disagreement with the call on the field, but they'll review it, and this is the element of the UIL State Championships that is available in this facility at AT&T Stadium yeah. with a veteran replay crew as well. Yeah, we talked to Coach Joseph about their defense. He talked about Dalton Johnson, number 43, as being their best defensive player all year long. And here in the state championship game comes up with a huge cause fumble early in the football game in the first quarter potentially here to get that ball to the Katy Tiger offense. So impactful play here from a defensive player potentially here as we get things going. We'll review it, and the call on the field was indeed a fumble. Certainly in slow motion, it looks like the ball was secured. We'll uh, discuss this right now, with the replay going on. The Rainies I talked about earlier was you know, Cedar Hill's number one receptions leader coming into this ball game. He came into the game with 47 receptions to lead the program. Well... They're still looking at this thing, and I think what you have to do is look at it in real time. I mean, so. looking at yep. slow motion, 
it looks like there's more time to do it. But we'd have to look, look at it in, in uh, real time. So the question is, is there enough time to secure the football in real time? That's the question. Now, it has to be enough to overturn the call in the field, which was catch and fumble. But that's a bang-bang play, Gary. Yeah, it really is. It is It is pretty quick, and we'll see how they... It wouldn't surprise me if they left it as called on the field, too, Craig, because it is such so quickly that it happened. Well, the other thing or, is... Or possibly, is he, possibly even call it an incomplete pass. And that may be the notes are making on a reset of the clock here. Here's Lance Mathis, the referee, with the, the call. After review, it was an incomplete pass. The ball be placed, second and ten. Clock operator, please put 6.30 on the game clock. Clock operator, please put 6.30 so on the, the game clock. The, Thank you. the call on the field overturned in the booth because of the replay. It's incomplete, and it brings up second down. Well, yeah, live to play another down here for this Longhorn offense to get back out there. Could not uh, recover that ball regardless. It was an incomplete pass and just get the second down here. But, again, good field position here for, for Cedar Hill as things start on, to unfold here late in this first quarter or midway through the first quarter. Good field position. Well, I agree with you. It's, it's a break for Cedar Hill. Now can the Longhorns capitalize on it? With second down and 10 at the KD 47. Kylan Ashton is the running back, and now there's a further stoppage. Wanted to make sure the clock was set. It was reset. Six and a half remaining in the first quarter. Salter, RPO, downfield, and that is in and out of the hands of the intended target. It'll bring up third down. And an opportunity to connect with Ernie Moore. It's incomplete. Well, this is a great job of a play call and design. The ball just a little bit thrown and he's just spinning around there. Moore is trying to catch that ball and bring it in and trying to defend it. There are the KD defensive backs. Well, what, a, what a great play call and design. Just not able to pull it in and looks like he's a little bit uh, banged up as he got off the field. So third and ten from the 47. That pass broken up. Nice play on the ball made by the strong safety. Hamilton and Martin. That is an excellent play from a safety coming across, knowing what the quarterback is doing. And what I saw was acceleration from the safety coming across to make that play and knock it away. So good job there by Katie defensively of negating this great field position and opportunity here for Cedar Hill to get something going here. And the defense makes some big plays. Longhorns to punt it again. Jaden Cardwell, Cardell, the senior, to kick it. High snap, Cardell able to get it away. He had a great 44-yard punt. This one shorter and an opportunity on the return for Ronnie Schneider. So the Tigers will start from their own 30, just a 23-yard punt. So the feeling out process continues in the 6A Division II state championship, the most unusual season ever. Just also happens to be the 100th year of high school football in the state of Texas. Fox Sports Southwest, in partnership with the University Interscholastic League, celebrates 100 years of Texas high school football. Presented by Jack in the Box. Right around the midway mark of the first quarter, the 6A Division II State Championship, Katie and Cedar Hill scoreless. Tigers getting ready to get the football for the second time in this opening quarter. We told you what an iconic coaching legend Gary Joseph is. 15 times to win a district title, eight times in the state championship round, four times to win a state title, three times the mythical national championships voted on across the country, and of course a Hall of Famer, member of the Texas High School Football Hall of Fame class of 2016. Also, also in, the, uh, in uh, the Texas High School Coaches Association's Hall of Honor. 
Yeah, he, and he's a pleasure to talk to. Very active still within the Texas High School Coaches Association. He's been that been doing that for years and years and years and very well respected in the coaching community and definitely a legend in Texas high school football. And son of the legend will be the first to tell you, the great Eddie Joseph, who was so many years a great coach and director of the High School Coaches Association in the 80s and 90s. Back to the ground and on first down, that's Seth Davis on the carry and spinning forward for four, Stephan Ingram the tackle for Cedar Hill. Well, let's see how this KD offense responds here on this second set of downs, see if this offensive line can, can kind of impose their will on this on this uh, Cedar Hill defense. Cedar Hill defensively, they have a lot of talent on this side of the football. So look for them to be around the football, creating havoc in a lot of different ways, both up front and in the secondary. It's a good matchup. Offset eye look with a snap from under center and a toss sweep to set Davis and there are the Longhorns to adjust. Davis dropped by Jalen Wilson and Joey Johnson, a loss of a yard. Yeah, Joey Johnson getting the start here in this ball game. You know, we were told late that he was going to start because of just production and good job by him of stepping up in there, getting into the backfield. And we've seen him around uh, the quarterback on a couple of occasions already this afternoon. So we'll bring up third down and seven. Carlos Lynn get his defense geared up for another stop. The younger Davis in the backfield. Extra blocking tight end on the field. Fuller shirts the receiver in motion. And Coger looking to throw over the middle and the ball caught for the first down. Taylor Salisbury, one of the four impact players we sit on whom to keep an eye. Catch for 11 yards. Well, this is not play action pass. This is pure drop back pass. Five step drop, hit the foot, throw the football to Salisbury on timing, which is exactly what Coger does. And so when you get your quarterback, a little bit of comfort zone there, throwing the football, getting a catch, getting it caught, and moving the chains, that's important for this KD offense as they move forward. Picked up a couple of first downs on the first possession, very nearly a third before punting. A first down here, and then Davis in trouble again, and down he goes. Right at the line of scrimmage, no gain on the play. And the first man knocked him off his pins, and then Marion Williams and Stephan Ingram teaming up on this. Well, you see the speed of this, of this defense here from Cedar Hills. There's no doubt that they're going to be able to contain things on the outside and run to the sideline. But you look at this power running attack. They actually asked the quarterback to be one of the lead blockers on some of these sweet tosses that they do. We'll see if Caleb Coger sticks his nose in there and makes some good blocks. He did on the previous play. He's up second down and 10. Movement. Each side pointing to the other. And this may march Katie back five yards. Ball start. Offense, number 76. Five-yard penalty remains second down. C.J. Marsh. The senior quick side tackle a little too quick that time. You know, this KD offense all season, Craig, it's, it's, it's been exceptional as far as scoring. They've averaged 49 points a ball game with this power running attack. And don't let it fool you, they can throw the football as well. But by and large, this is a running attack that has just been almost unstoppable all season for their opponents. And yeah, it's a wraparound draw to Jalen Davis, and here he goes. Davis. A big run of 14 yards. Very nearly picked up the first down there. Well, this is what happens when you have this style of offense. You're thinking the quarterback's going to roll out here, right? Well, a little bit of a trickery here because it's just going to be a wraparound draw. Essentially, the quarterback just puts it back to the running back going back the opposite way. Good job of play design. And as far as the alignment in front, the Cedar Hill was running towards that quarterback when there was a big hole there for him. Made up 14 of the 15 needed for the first down. Now out of a straight eye set on third down and one. Back to Davis. A first down and more inside the Cedar Hill 40-yard line. Eight more yards on the carry before Kendall Stevens, the senior safety, can wrap him up. I talked about this offensive line. Well, they've got a nickname around this group. It's called OLH, and that's for O-Line High. And it stands for the history and a little bit of the excellence of this offensive line play. And it all starts with their center, number 56, big old Bill Katsianis, and he does a great job of setting the table there, and he gets everybody lined up and makes sure everything is going through him, and he's the catalyst up there as this offensive line takes charge in the football game. To the ground again. Cedar Hill gang tackling at the line of scrimmage on the carry by Jalen Davis. And big Jalen Wilson, interior lineman on the stop. Average rushing for this football team, Craig, 275 yards a ball game. That's a lot. That's a lot of yards defenses have to deal with, and 
And when you play defense and you can't stop the run or slow the run down, it is it is essentially demoralizing. I know firsthand how, how that affects, affects the defense. And uh, this KD offense can really make it uncomfortable for defenses. Yeah, that's what they like to do, run the ball down it. They'll do it again to Davis. Trying to pound forward. Cedar Hill limits the game to three. Joey Johnson, Stephen Ingram, the tackle. Here's the thing that's also impressive, Gary, is that Katie, and you know they're going to run the ball at you, still able to get significant yardage on second and third down so far in this first quarter to give them opportunities to move the chains. Yeah, and this is an opportunity here where there's a little bit of uncomfortable, you know, for an offense. They're third and seven here on this down. Let's see what they do. I would consider them to think in this area of the field that is two down territory, even if they're going to run the football here. Coder looks to throw, however. Wide open. Downfield. There's the catch. Taylor Sosbury. 37 yards for the touchdown. Well, when you run the ball as well as they do, watch everybody commit inside from Cedar Hill. Nobody accounts for the receiver, Salisbury, as he does a little angle route back to the far corner of the end zone. And just an easy throw and catch from Coger to Salisbury. That play-action passing game working to perfection as they continue to run the ball. Modulate on for the extra points. That kick is good. How about that on third and seven off play action? Coger to Salisbury, 37-yard touchdown strike. Well, a little earlier we saw we com a completed pass by the quarterback to a, lo a lower player, but watch number 18 at the top of your screen up there. He is wide open, so this is the play they run, and now they're going to come back to it, and they're going to throw it for a touchdown. So that's exactly what has happened here. You've got the same route combination, and Cedar Hill blew it twice in a row, and this time they made him pay for it. So a 7-0 Tiger League that pound away at you with the run, pound away, and then come off play action wide open, Salisbury. It, exactly. So, you know, you just, your eyes for a defensive back, your eyes have to be where they're supposed to be on the defensive side of the ball. On the offensive side, they're looking for you to draw in those types of players so they can get those explosive hits behind you in the play action game, and it work to perfection. Very efficient jack-of-the-box scoring drive of 71 yards and nine plays, doing it on the ground until the touchdown pass and three for three on third down as we mentioned off to a really good start of the Tigers in the third down category. Yeah, when you can convert that it gives you momentum and it keeps those drives alive and Gary Joseph goes about moving the chains as a football team and that's exactly what uh, KD does and they do it repetitively and now they want to put their defense out there and be, and be strong on the defensive side of the ball and shake up this Cedar Hill offense even more. Kickoff. Lezik in the air and a fair catch called for, so it'll be out of the 25-yard line for Cedar Hill. Well, now we'll see how the Longhorns try to respond. Katie's done a good job so far against Caden Salter. He's come up with a couple plays and one good RPO, but they've been able to tighten down and prevent them from moving the chains enough. Well, Cedar Hill, you know, they're an explosive offense. We've talked about that. Big play capability, averaging 36 points a ball game as they come in here and you know, and Caden Salter's done it all. You know, he can run the football, throw the football, kind of a blended style there for, for him as a dual threat type of a quarterback. And talked about his skill and his ability. And I think there's a lot, a lot of football left here. Oh, my goodness. Big play there defensively coming with a big hit. A loss of two. Jaden Maronin defensively for Katie stepping in there from his linebacker spot. Big senior linebacker just laying the wood to him. Well, it's putting Cedar Hill in second down and long as the toss went to Cedric Garden and wrapped up. Pressure coming again. Salter now will take off and run and steps out of bounds able to pick up some significant yardage up to the 31 yard line or 30 yard line we talked about caden salter in the open to start this ball game and the ability to see downfield and use his feet to his advantage that's exactly what happened there it looked like this was going to be completely taken away by the defense but he in in, in in a sense found a way to get some positive yardage on the play with just a, just an improvised scramble and 
that's what he brings to the table because he's just that type of an explosive athlete that has extreme capabilities. Tigers need six here on third down from, or the uh, Longhorns need six on third down from the Cedar Hill 29. Here comes the blitz again, and right over the middle, intercepted. What a great break on the ball by Shepard Bowling, the outside linebacker, diving to come up with a pick and give it right back to Katie. Well, Caden Salter throws a slinger here. It's kind of a three-quarter shot that he's thinking he's going to get to a receiver in the middle of the field. And when you throw the football in the middle of the field, you've got to be careful because there's always these linebackers and safeties. What an effort that time to come up with that football by Shepard Bowling. Heck of a job there for the senior. Huge turnover here for Katie on the defensive side of the ball here. Bowling comes up with a nice interception as you... As, I'm sure that uh, Caden Salter never even saw Bowling coming into the screen. Shepard Bowling, an interesting journey of his own to be able to continue playing. One more on that coming up. Meanwhile, back to the ground. And on first down, it's Seth Davis with an excellent carry of eight yards on what will be the final play of the first quarter. Katie able to get the uh, third down touchdown pass off play action. And then coming up with a turnover to set up the Tigers in very good field position. Into the first quarter of the UIL 6A Division II State Championship from AT&T Stadium in Arlington. The Katy Tigers out to a 7-0 lead on the Cedar Hill Longhorns. Katie with a 7-0 lead on the Cedar Hill Longhorns. First quarter in the books of the UIL 6A Division II State Championship. First quarter numbers are forward first quarter stats. And you see Cedar Hill unable to get the ground game going. That's Katie's MO, even though they get the touchdown on the pass. And now the turnover has set up Katie, perhaps, to capitalize again. Greg Way, Gary Reasons, also Katie Engelson, and over by... The uh, Katie sideline, our Lauren Blackwell. Thanks, Greg. Well, we just saw that huge play by Shepard Bowling to wrap up the first quarter, and he's got a very interesting story. Very recently in his career, he was told multiple times that he might never play football again. Prior to the season opener in 2018, he felt two jolts in his arm that caused temporary numbness. The following weeks, it happened enough times that he visited a spine specialist who told him you'll never play again. And after a second opinion and months of rehab, he received the same news. The diagnosis was a narrowing of the spine, but the bowlings weren't going to give up. They received a third opinion and a glimmer of hope. While he couldn't play that following season, as he joined his team at practices and meetings and learned as much as he could, miraculously returned in 2019. And since then, he's only missed two games, was named captain, and obviously has made a tremendous impact on this team. No doubt about it, Lauren. Thank you. Making an impact there. Off play action. Caleb Coker, Coger to Nick Anderson for 30 yards. It'll be first and goal for the Tigers. Same play that they ran to the opposite side. It's just a felt fullback to the flat and then just the, basically the angle uh, post, or excuse me, the flag route by the outside receiver, Nick Anderson, that time coming up with a big throw and catch here from Caleb Coger. So they did the same play to the opposite side that they scored the touchdown on. Line up. Out of the eye, Isaiah Smith, the fullback, Jalen Davis, the deep back in the eye. And it is Davis on the toss sweep. Following, blocks it into the end zone. Jalen Davis across for his 25th rushing touchdown of the season to put Katie up by double digits. Yeah, and it happens in a hurry. You see the defensive touch interception, which turns into two plays for a score. One on a pass to Nick Anderson to bring it down here, and then Davis just punches it in here with this powerful offensive line imposing its will here on this Cedar Hill defense. I'll tell you another thing that's impressive, Gary, as we see Modulasic on for the extra points. And that kick is good. The play of the sophomore quarterback, Caleb Coger, very composed where I had the one uh, intentional grounding call. Other than that, he's run the RPO game well. He's done a good job. You, you said it exactly, Greg, and this is precisely what Gary Joseph told us. I like his composure. He's a very composed young man. He's learning how to be a leader of this football team. He's just a sophomore, but that's coming over time. But he is a composed player, Gets his, does his execution, and he relies on what the, what his coaching has taught him. And Caleb Coger's done a nice job here leading his team as he's gotten a, few, uh, a touchdown pass and a strike there. And uh, 
you know, he, he's right at 150, and I think that's maybe with the <laughs> pockets full of change. You, you know, that sort of thing. But uh, heady young man so far with what he's done in leading that Tiger attack. So it's 14-0 for Gary Joseph's ball club. Cedar Hill has to find a way to respond here, Gary. Yeah, I think it's just kind of going really, really fast right now. The game seems to be moving very fast in the favor of the Katy Tigers. And Cedar Hill, they're reeling just a little bit. So just as you said, Craig, they've got to find some ground here to kind of, kind of slow that ship down and kind of get their ship going as well. Another short kick. This one not a fair catch. Fielding on the run and up to the 30-yard line is where the Longhorns will operate. Well, with all the talk about Katie's ground attack, there's good reason. Look back over the last decade alone where two backs have combined to rush for more than 3,000 yards, and that includes this season with the Brothers Davis. And there yeah. you just see that going back to 2010 right there, those those five there. It's but, impressive, yeah. When you put these numbers together, that's what makes this offensive machine run. That's what they do, this offensive line that OLH, offensive line high. That's what you want to build a chemistry, and they've done it for years. What can Caden Salter do to get his team going? Well, first down, quick hit. As he works at the Jalen Clemmer, senior receiver for a gain of six. So for Carlos Lynn, you know, and his Cedar Hill football team, I, I think that they've just got to settle down and do what they do. And that means they've got to rely on their quarterback, Caden Salter, put them in the best position to make plays. And he's got to be able to be creative back there. And, and it does happen for him. To, he's not as much as I think as a timing thrower as, as, as a, that this offense would need to be. He's much more of a, of a player that can make plays with his feet. That's what and he's also looking to do here. with his arm. Yep, good point. And he's got enough for the first down to move the chains. Exactly what you just laid out there, Gary, both with the arm and the feet on those two snaps. And they put it on his on his shoulders to be able to do that. And that's kind of a heavy weight for this young man, but it's worked out so far this season. They're here in the state championship game, and that's where they expected to be at the start of the season. We talked to Coach, Je to, to Coach Lynn about this team. He, he said just that. He says, we expected to be here. We have a lot of talent. There were a couple of things along the way that kind of pushed them there. The loss that they had to Duncanville, they thought, wait, they if they had some hiccups in that ball game, but they thought they could have won that ball game to be an unblemished card coming in here to the state championship game. Yep. And now Cedar Hill is going to have to use its time second timeout. Cedar Hill, that's their second of the half. As the uh, staff didn't like what they, the alignment they have. You see Carlos Lynn there. He, of course, had coached a powerlifting state championship, played on the state championship team at Wilmer Hutchins 30 years ago for the legendary Hall of Fame coach Robert Woods, and they had an incredible defense. He was a captain of that team that won on an icy covered field at Floyd Casey Stadium in Waco, beating a favored Westlake High team from Austin, 19 to seven in 10 degrees, yeah. your kind of ball game. Love that stuff, and Carlos Lynn, he is the epitome of what I think should be a high school football coach. He's a pleasure to talk to. And his ability to instruct and help young men, young 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 African Americans under his guide, he, he talked about that with us on the call, and he is exceptional communicator, and really he, he illustrates that and also teaches that to his to his football team, and he and he's changing lives. And he's trying to get guys to respond to step in, and for more on that, since Cedar Hill's a little shorthanded, we check in with Katie Engelson. Cedar Hill struggling to get that ground game going. Now they are missing a key piece in its backfield. Senior running back Kevin Young broke his right ankle against Waco Midway in the team's regular season finale. Coach Lynn said he is an every down back, saying you lose everything with him. He's going to block, run, catch. Coach Lynn added that they have to be more creative, more intentional with their approach in that run game because of his absence. And although he can't be out there playing, he is watching from the sidelines, cheering on his team. Yeah, he, he had a tremendous junior season a year ago, and, you know, he he was a, kind of the newcomer to the program and did a great job then. This year they lost over 700 production yards with him as he started those first eight games of the season, and he was supposed to be the guy back there next to Salter, and it didn't go that way, so now they're being, it's being made up with others. Receiver screen snipped out by the Tiger defense as the pass went to Julian Austin and coming over to get him, Dalton Johnson, and Caden Robertson, it's a loss of two. So the two yards gained on the first down carry given back 
on the receiver screen, and now Cedar Hill facing third down and long again, third yeah. and ten. They've got to find a way to convert here because they have 0 for 3, Craig, as we showed earlier on third down conversions early in this ball game, and they have got to move the chains here to do something to take the pressure off of their defense. The defense has not been able to hold up against this KD offense, and so the offense has to help their defense out in this regard. And they got to hurry, too, to get the playoff at time. They're not going to do it. It's going to cost them five more yards. Cedar Hill was slow to get the players they wanted on the Play field. Play a game. Offense. It's a five-yard penalty. Remains third down. They were trying to get the players on the field that they wanted and get the other ones off the field in time. And you can see Coach Lynn not happy about that at all because it just became third down and 15. Well, they still have one timeout left, so they certainly could have used it there to save that five yards. I think it would have been a great use of a timeout. They elected not to. At least maybe they just didn't. The coaches couldn't see on the field that the time was about to expire. So now third down and 15 for the Long Warrants, and another flag comes down. And Cedar Hill just can't get organized right Ball now. Ball start. Offense number 21, five-yard penalty, remains third down. That one on Chris Allen. Well, there's not a lot of plays in the playbook that you say, okay, let's get uh, fourth, third down, and 20-ish to, <laughs> to be able to get a first down here. This is going to have to be something creative, and the quarterback is going to have to have some time to throw that ball down the field if you're looking to even you know, get anything close to that first down. So almost an explosive play that you're going to need here from this Cedar Hill offense to get a first down. Out of third down at 20. Salter with pressure coming. Backside rush coming, and he'll be clipped from behind. Cal Varner, the senior defensive end, and future Rice Howe running him down from behind after only a three-yard game. Yeah, what speed here by this defensive end, and he's done it all along, all season long here for, for Cal Varner. He's at number 91. Just watch the play here that he has with the ability from his left defensive end spot and just track around the defensive ta offensive tackle and then get to the quarterback and bring him short of, of the line of game. So there's a huge play there defensively by Varner. Bob Orange have to punt it again. Cardell able to get the knuckleball kick away and then leaning forward is Antonio Silva to dive forward for the catch a 27 yard punt. Katie up 14 and with the football in good field position. It's all working for Katie so far. The Tigers up 14 nothing approaching the midway mark of the second quarter and we've talked about how incredible this program has been under Gary Joseph, Gary yeah, Reasons. Yeah, really, and they, they're 12-1 and one this year coming in here, but really they have one loss. It's a unique loss. In 12 years, they had their first district loss at Katie Tompkins this year, and, you know, when we talked to Coach, Coach Joseph about that, he said that that was kind of a galvanizing moment for their football team to bring them together and refocus, and that's then they've propelled and they've rolled ever since that time. So kind of an eye-opener to lose a district game, and it means something so much to them to get them and propel them to a state championship. So Tigers ready to go back to work. We're up by a score of 14 to nothing here after the 27-yard punt. Good field position for Katie. And they'll start from the 42. See what they've been doing over the last seven ball games. Been putting a lot of points on the board. Back to the ground to the younger Davis, Seth, the sophomore. And let's go down to the Katie sideline. Check in with Lauren Blackwell. Hey guys, well heading into week six in November, Katie was riding a 75 game district winning streak, a game in which head coach Gary Joseph says was a turning point that week at the loss to Katie Tompkins. But guys, that run was an incredible feat. It lasted 12 years over that span. Katie won two state championships, made five appearances in a title game. Another interesting fact, 26 of those 75 games were shutouts, 45 were won by 40 or more points. And hey, last time, they lost a district game. They ended up winning a state title. So maybe history will repeat itself, Craig? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. they're looking good so far, Lauren. Thank you. And there's the uh, the toss to Seth Davis. And, you know, that's the other impressive thing in watching this group work, Gary, is Jalen Davis pound away, pound away, pound away. There is a flag down. And then, of course, the touchdown pass. And they come back again, pound away, pound away on the ground again, following the turnover. Personal foul, face mask, defense number 28. 15-yard penalty will be added to the end of the run. Automatic first down. Conversely, and unfortunately for Cedar Hill, they 
just can't really get going. It's it's a lot of the wheel spinning and and uh, the turnover plus the penalties have hurt. Yeah, and this is a defense for Cedar Hill that has allowed 16 points per ball game. Okay, Katie's at 14 now, moving the football already early in this ball game. So, you know, it's mounting here. The pressure is mounting on this Cedar Hill football team and specifically on this defense. So now with the first down of the 29. Back to the ground again to Davis. Jalen Davis pounding for this. Time. And this, you know, earlier we, we were talking about Gary Howe. Gary Joseph did not like the, the position of his team being in third and 22, third and 17. This is what he likes right now. 14 nothing, pounding ahead and in an offensive rhythm with his ground game. There's no doubt about it. When, you, when you're able to play call with this offense, Gerald Brixley, the offensive coordinator, is just calling a, a splendid game here, being able to just dial things in here, getting what, getting the matchups that he wants with his offensive line, receivers, play action pass, it's all working. Back to the ground again. A couple more for Jalen Davis. Brings up third down and short. And when you're, when you're having third and two, third and three, well, it opens up the world of the playbook, even though that playbook is largely ground-based. Exactly, and, and even here, especially in this part of the, of the field, you know, you know that this is two-down territory, so they're, they're going to continue to pound and do whatever they want. This is a play caller's dream to be third and two, you know, here, you know, plus, plus territory and just doing things exceptionally well. Back to the ground again. And right at the first down marker is Jalen Davis, and it's enough to move the change yet again. It's just a machine. They did, they're just rolling guys in, rolling them out, you know, and kind of come, come in and out. There's just a lot of speed and power that they put at this defense. Defensively, they're out there with their 11 players continually, and they're the same guys out there trying to defend this offense that seems multiple, but it's still a power running attack. Off play action. A waggle back the other way, and too much on it was ahead of the intended target, target eight McKinney out of the backfield, but in front of Taylor Salisbury, and it's incomplete. Yeah, a lot of movement being asked by the quarterback to do some things in the backfield, which takes a lot of orchestration, and he just didn't look comfortable throwing that football after all of that orchestration. So that ball, not the best ball that he's thrown, I'm sure, this season, and it falls short for sure. the ground on second and ten and that's Seth Davis pounding forward a flag goes down as Davis is near another first down eight yards maybe nine on the carry but we'll check the flag as the Davis brothers continue to alternate carries pounding away at that Longhorn defense Conversation on the field for this Tyler Bass chapter. That's Mathis, the lead official, the referee. Personal foul, chop block, offense number 26. That's a 15 yard penalty from the previous spot. Remain second down. Big penalty to push Katie back. Well, Isaiah Smith, the fullback, that's a block inside the hole there. That's not a chop block because it's not from an offensive lineman. I'm not really sure why they would call that. You can lead block and, and block below the waist from a, running from a fullback position. It's the offensive line affected with chop blocks. So Gary Joseph asking for an explanation of it. It's back to the 30 called I, ISO fullback lead. Greg, <laughs> I, I, used to, I used to have to play that play. <laughs> Draw play this time. Seth Davis wrapped up and a nice job with that long for defense coming over to get him was Taryn Black, the senior defensive tackle. Yeah, but nothing, nothing really strange here. They're just going to continue to pound to do what they do offensively. This might be just a touch outside of field goal range if they can't convert here on third down. Expect them to go on fourth. Two down territory is my point. Three yard carry there for Seth Davis remains in the backfield. And Alcover 
setting up the screen and overthrowing Davis. I'll tell you who sniffed it out was Charles Esters, the third. He saw it leap, couldn't come down with what would have been an easy pick six had he been able to come up with the pass too high. It is fourth down, however. Yeah, good play by Esters, and he's been one of the elite players on this defense, and just been all around the all around the football. Twelve sacks on the season leads him in that category, and pitch in ten QBHs, which means that he's hurrying the quarterback. Good job defensively all year long for this Cedar Hill defense. Well, here's Demondi Lutzik who's going to try a 49-yard field goal. You say 49? He's hit a 47-yarder this year, and he's a perfect seven for seven on field goals out of the hold of Hamlet. Play clock. Mick Martin, and uh, the play clock's going to go to zero, but Katie calls a timeout. Timeout. Katie, that's their first of the half. Well, Gary Joseph will make sure he's got his guys ready to go, and we may see that 49-yard field goal try coming up here late in the first half of the 6A Division II Championship. Welcome back to AT&T Stadium for the 6A Division II State Championship game. Katie leads Cedar Hill 14-0 here in the second quarter. Well, my name is Katie Angleson, and I am covering the Katie Cedar Hill game. And if you think that is a little bit confusing, you may want to take a look at Cedar Hill's roster. They have about several names that are very similar. That includes five Jadens and four Jalens. Coach Lynn told us, he said, if you say Jaden on the field at practice, just about everyone turns around. And hey, that makes sense. Looking at this, this graphic here, Craig and Gary, try saying this list five times fast. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you, Katie. And, and, you know, of course, we added to the confusion by having Katie on the Cedar Hill sideline, not on the Katie sideline. That said, Katie, part of our outstanding reporting staff throughout the course of the season on High School Scoreboard Live was at several Katie games. Well, here's year. Katie at Katie. I uh, love it, love it, love it. And uh, you're doing a great job with the Jalen's out there, by the way, Craig. <laughs> Well, they'll actually uh, put this down just inside of the 49-yard line, but I think it's still going to officially be called a 49-yard try for Nemanja Lasik. 49-yarder, plenty of leg on wow. it, and this one is good. Look at this young man. Wow. Congratulations. What a moment for him. 49-yard field goal in a high school state championship game at AT&T Stadium. What a memory. They'll actually say it's 48, but hey, it's still his longest of the year. He'd hit a 47-yarder. They'll officially call it a 48-yard field goal. I think it's about as center post as you could just about get there. That kick was perfect, and it had room to spare. Look at it. I bet it's good for another five or six yards. You think the adrenaline's flowing with that young man? Great oh. job. You don't see that a lot at the high school level, folks, and I really applaud the young man. Great job. Hey, you see Kerry Joseph like it. What he's seeing there to add to it to make this now a three score ball game at 17 nothing. Yeah, and there's a lot of folks who are watching high school football who are coaches at the collegiate level saying, hey, can we get that guy? <laughs> <laughs> he, he could win football games for us. So that's what you do. You get fine young men who can has a have a great talent and and he's certainly one of those. Well, and, and of course, uh, folks who watch the telecast, they hear us refer to the fact that we we visit with the head coaches. We do it in the conference call, and everybody's on it, obviously. The, uh, the uh, broadcast crew and our producer, Mike Dressman, and the staff, and we get on there, and we and one of the questions that, that Mike asked him is, how's your kicker's range? Yeah. That sort of thing. And, uh, and most of them will say, yeah, 30, 35 yards, something like that. <laughs> Not here. This young man can boom it. Here's the kick. It'll be returned, but a lot of trouble just trying to canal turning the corner a little bit is Keandre Jackson. There is a flag down, however. That took a while to set up, Gary, as Jackson was trying to turn the corner, and there may have been a block or a hold along the way. Yeah, sometimes when you go across the field, the position that you have, as we see a, a Katie player down on the field here, Injury timeout on the field. While we do that, we can tell you that the 48-yard field goal by Lozick tied the all-time 6A state championship record for longest field goal. The last kid to do it, Chris Perez of Katy five years ago against <laughs> Lake Travis in the uh, 2015 state championship game. That was down at NRG Stadium in Houston. And right now here in Arlington, it's all Tigers. The uh, injured Tiger was J.R. Sayanis, who's 
We're able to lead the field under his own power. The penalty was for a chop block on the return, so the difficulties continue for Cedar Hill backing the Longhorns up to their own 12-yard line here. Salter trying to find some running room. It just isn't there. Only a yard. The Tiger defense closing quickly. Hunter Washington, the corner, in on the tackle for Katie. You know, last time that uh, Cedar Hill came off the field, you know, we actually had a camera shot here that we were able to, to look internally here at the quarterback on, on the sideline, on the bench. Looked a little bit distressed. You know, he wasn't as happy with his performance. And, you know, the coach came over and talked to him and basically said, hey, calm down and, and you just got to get back out there and put things together. And let's see how they respond. A lot of pressure here. And that pass is caught. And just fighting forward is JVN Clemmer. He's able to get something out of it when it looked like it could be a lot worse. Ty Kanye comes over on the tackle. He was in on that last one as well. He was one of our impact players we we're talking about, Gary, and he's made his presence felt. Yeah, this defense has really been, you know, pretty good about getting in the backfield and disrupting what the ability of Caden Salter has been able to do with the football. He's not been able to orchestrate like he normally has in his football game, and we're gonna have to see how well they can they can uh, make some adjustments here to get moving. On third down at six, and fumble. Salter able to pick it up and get rid of it incomplete. Too much on it. Twice it was nearly disastrous. And Anthony Thomas, the intended target, once on the fumble and then on the pass and went up in the air. Carlos Lynn can only kind of smile and look at it and say, what else can happen right now? Yeah, when it rains, it pours, right? Well, you can do a little fake here, trying to do the pump fake out there to the outside to set the defense and throw it back. And he knows he's going to do a screen pass back here to the inside slot receiver, Davis. And he tosses it out there, but a little too tall for him. And they don't convert again on third down. Cardell to punt. Uncorks a good one at a time that Cedar Hill needed an over-the-shoulder grab by Ronnie Schneider and now turns it back upfield. And good coverage by the Cedar Hill punt team downfield. It's a 49-yard punt and only three yards on the return. That was something the Longhorn special teams really needed. Now they need a defensive stop to not allow this deficit to grow any larger before the half is done. No doubt about it. Andor possibly create a turnover here. Possibly get some momentum in this football game for, for Cedar Hill. The momentum has been in this entire half on the sidelines of the KD Tigers, and they've been inspired with their play. I don't think, I haven't seen that as much with Cedar Hill. Just across the 38-yard line, back to the ground again, and a quick spurt on first down for Jalen Davis. Yeah, they go unbalanced. They have power run game that they can do to the front side of that of that uh, overload that they run, and also to the back side. Good job by these running backs, both the brothers, Davis. They they both absolutely have the ability to cut that back and, and take it wherever the daylight is. Second down, and a long six needed. And Jalen Davis on the carry. Yeah, good tackle that time on the outside, just coming up and being physical on that is Tyron Bird, the number four from his corner position. He's out there, got to defend on the run, excuse me, on the passing zone, but also on the edge, a cornerback has to come in and make a physical tackle once in a while, and, and that was a good one. Here's the key down, now coming up on third down, the term which team might consider getting into a hurry-up mode. And the wraparound draw, breaking through as Isaiah Smith. Say goodnight to it. Smith will take it in for a 55-yard touchdown. Well, this is taking it back in time. This is an old, old play. Fullback just sits there and wraps around and puts that ball in there, and everybody goes away, and he just kind of ducks behind. Kind of a delayed draw, but it worked to perfection for Katie, and he runs through that last opportunity of a potential tackle en route to their next touchdown. Very impressive play. The extra point makes it 24 to nothing Tigers here with 36 seconds remaining in the half. 
A lot of people call this the wraparound draw, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> There's other names for it, and these coaches all know it. Who I, and they know the name I'm talking about. But it is certainly one that worked to perfection here for Katie, and it's a, a big score here late in this second quarter. And again, Craig, the momentum here is all with the Tigers. Excellent blocking up front, Gary, to create that hole. Even the wraparound, the deception is one thing, but if the hole doesn't exist, it's probably going to be a limited gain. Instead, that hole's big and. It's off. Yeah, it's all just washed down. You're trying to wash down, and so that that running back could just squirt through there and make that make that explosive run, which he did. So everything seems to be working here for Katie. The play calling has been exceptional. Gerald Brickley's done a nice job with his offense on the coordinating side and getting things going. And really, he's got the, he's got the touch right now, calling plays and see some, what the numbers here. Three plays of 30 yards or more for Katie in this football game. Those are big, huge, explosive plays. Tigers expand their lead and Cedar Hill back on its heels here. Longhorns have one timeout remaining, but only 36 seconds remaining in the half. Losick with another shorter range kickoff, but uh, that one fielded over the shoulder momentarily and then bring it up across the 25 yard line is Brian Rainey. Wouldn't surprise me here if uh, Cedar Hill takes a knee. Uh, you know, they, they have to find a way to flip the switch here, and that's exactly what Carlos Lynn has to do to get in get into halftime and, and get his troops kind of turned around because it's not going their way here. So no need to be foolish here with the football. I would expect that they would likely just kind of kind of slow things down. They're going out there in their spread formation. <laughs> Maybe an RPO and see if they can get something to break free with the ball in the hands of Salter. That's what it looks like. He will throw. It is caught. And it's short of the first down. So Katie will have to scramble to the line of scrimmage on the nine-yard catch by Clemmer. You see the seconds ticking off here in the first half. Cedar Hill just trying to get one more play off here before the half is done. This will be the final play of the half, barring a penalty. Catch, and that'll do it for the first half. A first half dominated in many different ways by the KD Tigers with their ground game, their deception, with their defense, and with their opportunistic style, taking advantage of turnovers and field position to establish a 24 to nothing halftime lead. Well, you laid it out there very well, Craig, and that's exactly what happened. So KD coming in here got all the momentum on their side. They made the plays. They converted their third downs. They converted opportunities with the turnovers into points. It's been an exceptional half for KD. Coming up on the Ford Halftime Show, yeah, the Tigers definitely on the hunt here. And whether you're thinking that the game tonight will present dodgeball or the Dodge Bowl, you're going to see it on display between Westlake and Southlake Carroll tonight in the 6A Division I state championship. But here at halftime of the 6A Division II title game, it is all Katie and the head coach of the Tigers, Gary Joseph, down on the field with our Lauren Blackwell. Coach, you said in order to be successful this week, you need to move the chains and put points on the board. How impressed have you been with your offense as a unit in doing so, so far today? Well, they've done well so far. You know, we're running the football okay. You know, they're pretty tough up front and stuff, but I'm proud of our kids for sitting there hanging in there. And, and uh, with no doubt, you know, the, the scoreboard for us, it doesn't matter. It's just got to sit there and go out like they haven't scored a point. And uh, we haven't scored a point, and we're going to have to be more physical in the second half. Containing Caden Salter and the Cedar Hill offense, not an easy task, but your defense outstanding so far in this one. What's working so well for them this afternoon? Uh, they're playing together, being very unselfish, and, and each one of them is, is trying to do their job. And, you know, right now, like I said, this, this is uh, really important for us to sit there and come out of the half playing extremely well. Coach, thanks for your time. Craig? Thank you. All right, thank you, Lauren. Plain spoken man. Gary Jones would say our guys are playing for each other. It shows 24-0, Katie at the half. The four and a half time show is coming up next. We've hit the break of the 6A to 
Division II state championship game at AT&T Stadium. And after a scoreless tie for about the first 11 minutes, the Hungry Tigers hunt would begin. Katie with three scores in the first half, two dimes from Caleb Koger, and a 49-yard drilling from the kicker, Naman Halazic, as Katie takes a 24-0 lead over Cedar Hill into the locker room. And as we welcome you into the Ford Halftime Show, Aaron Hardigan, along the managing editor of Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine, Greg Tepper. And I got to ask you, is this the way you pictured it playing out in the first two quarters? Uh, I'll tell you that I thought Katie was probably the favorite in this one, but they have come out and flexed their muscles on national television in a big way. Defense, offense, special teams, it is clicking on all cylinders right now well, for Gary Joseph's squad. How are they doing it? Let's take us you into the Baylor Scott and White game diagnosis because you mentioned that aggressive Cedar Hill front. I need to ease up a bit. That's exactly what's going on, is that Cedar Hill came out determined to slow down the run. And as a result, their front four are getting upfield quick, quick, quick. And as a result, all this misdirection is working. Draw plays, play action. Katie is getting big plays from off of these change-ups, right? The fastball has been working okay. The change-up is getting strikeout after strikeout right now, and they're getting big-time plays from their offense, especially in play action. And the peanut play, the big run right before, right before the halftime, a huge play there for the Katie Tigers. The offense really starting to feel themselves, and you got to feel like this is an avalanche that's coming down on Cedar Hill I right just want to see Lazic's pose after that 49-yard drilling of a field goal. In fact, as we head on up to the booth to C.T. Steckel and the coach, Ken Purcell, who always harps on kick game, celebrate, young man. What a nail. He hit that absolutely pure and ties a record. Really good stuff. But let's talk about this KD defense. Caden Salter, we know what type of player he is, coach. 7-14 in the first half. The interception that we saw really limited. Coach, how is this KD defense causing such disruption? Well, I think it's focus. They are really focused in. Everyone's doing their job. They're laterally going down the line when they have to. Also, they're getting linebackers loose on the pass rush, and Salter's really having trouble handling that. They're very disciplined. They run to the ball. All of that's included. Cedar Hill 0 for 5 on third down, just 76 total yards in the first half. That's less than four yards a play. So you're in the locker room. You're looking at a bunch of young players who have had success this year. How do you turn it around? Where do you start making the adjustments? Well, as we always said, one play at a time. We're, as if I'm Cedar Hill, I'm saying we're not making plays. We've had two touchdown passes dropped where we were behind the defense. We didn't make the play. We've got to settle down, become the team we've been all year long, and make plays. When you have a big-time player like a Caden Salter, you don't want to say the moment's too big for him because I don't believe it is. But how do you get him to just calm down, take a deep breath, see the field a little bit better, and maybe give himself an opportunity here in the second half? Well, I think halftime is a chance to calm down. you got a 28-minute halftime that you can sit down and say, what are, they, what are you seeing? What are they doing to you? And I think that you can settle a team down like that. But right now, it just comes down to, I think Carlos Lynn, the head coach at Cedar Hill, is saying, guys, we're not playing good football. We're having penalties, we're having turnovers, and we're not blocking people. So we've got to get all that solved. The game's not over. He's in a tough hole right now. They are. And we'll have to see how they can climb out of that hole. Yeah, one thing we know, Tep, Aaron, this team will not quit. 24 minutes left to play here, and they'll show some heart. Yeah, most certainly. And I think one thing that's really impressive about this KD defense, what we've seen so far, is that Caden Salter's had some room to work. He's had some opportunities to go out there and make some plays, but Katie's been all over them. Katie's found a way to contain him and not let him have these running lanes. That is where Caden Salter is so is so uh, deadly, is when he's able to tuck it and run. And he's been able to escape the pocket, but he hasn't been able to take off downfield with it. And that's a big reason why Katie's up on top. Who was Carlos Lynn's mentor at Cedar Hill? Joey McGuire and who lived for these moments with the back against the wall the Cedar Hill Longhorns do not count them out of this one we are just at the break of the 6A Division 2 state championship game and with much more ahead here on the forward halftime show in fact the UIL executive director joins Craig Way when we return Halftime of the UIL 6A Division II State Football Championship game at AT&T Stadium in Arlington. Katie Tigers on top of the Cedar Hill Longhorns 24 to nothing. This, of course, the final day in the most unusual of 
football seasons across the state of Texas, no matter the level. And, of course, that means the UIL are so pleased to be joined by the executive director of the University of Scholastic League, Dr. Charles Prada. Charles, I'm going to start at the same spot I started with your deputy director, Jamie Harrison, yesterday. The same place I'm going to start at tonight with Dr. Susan Elsa, your director of athletics. It's it, I know everybody has to be just thrilled after everything that's happened to get this season to the finish line. Well, we're kind of elated that uh, we've gotten to the finish line, but a little sad, too, because it's been quite a journey. We've been 21 weeks with 5A, 6A football, uh, and it seems like we'd never get here. But it's been a great run. Our coaches, our players, our fans, our parents particularly, the administrators who helped make this happen. I'm so proud of all of them. Uh, and it all can happen in Texas this way. Really proud of our group. What has stood out to you most, Charles, about how this was able to be completed when there were times, obviously, certainly in the late summer when things were looking a little bit doubtful and even at times during the fall, even as you were still having 90 to 95 percent of your games played to completion? That's correct, Craig. I'll tell you the thing that strikes me is patience. Our coaches were immensely patient. They had to wait to see what was going to happen while being prepared for whatever uh, things were coming next. No one knew. So it, things were changing almost on an hour-to-hour -hour basis. Uh, so just the patience for our coaches. I, I, and I know here the patience continues to be a virtue for everybody involved since now we're into the winter sports and basketball getting into the spring sports because I know how much you and your staff also want to see the basketball season and the spring sports play to their conclusion, which they were unable to do in 2020. Yeah, you know, one of the things we talked about is trying to give the spring sports something because they got nothing last year. And the one thing that I'm disappointed about, we couldn't do more for our 100th anniversary of football and for basketball. And I want to ask you, who's on your Mount Rushmore of coaches for the top 100? <laughs> you put me on the spot yeah. there, right? There's some great ones there off of that. I know this, you and your staff go on the Mount Rushmore <laughs> for school administrators for what you've done this season to make sure that these games wind up being played. Charles, we appreciate the time. Congratulations on an outstanding year, and we're looking forward to more successes as we work through these unusual times. Thanks, Greg. All right, that's Dr. Charles Brightup, Executive Director of the University Interscholastic League. More of the Ford Halftime Show coming up right after this. Well, and as we return to Coach Ken Purcell and C.T. Steckel, keep in mind, guys, Riley and Todd each had to dethrone the last two 6A <laughs> Division I state finalists to get here. So that's also a key storyline. Yeah, it is not easy to get to this building and play for a state championship. But what is so fun for me as a coach's kid, talking to the coach <laughs> who coached his kids, the opportunity to stand on the other sideline and play for a title, knowing that you've got blood there and that you're going to be a competitor and that you're going to try to beat him, Coach. What must this moment be like for the two of them? Well, as they said, it, it's a great moment for both of them. But I think that both of them would tell you it's not about us. Mm -hmm. It's not about us. It's about our kids and our team and our program. Now, I love them to, when they talk about the specifics of the game. The, the play calls, the audibles, all those things have to be changed because I'm sure they're still using many of those hot colors and, and play calls, audibles, all of those things are the same. So you decide, do you give a dummy call or do you go ahead and make the call? There's a lot of, it's a real chess match between yep. two really good coaches. We're going to have the audio turned up in this one because we want to hear all about it at the line of scrimmage, how they make checks, get in and out of bad plays into good plays, and how they go about playing that game of disguise and trying to outsmart each other. It is going to be a lot of fun to watch these two teams take the field later tonight, guys. And again, Todd and Riley spoke this week. Todd said it's the first time he ever spoke with an opposing coach going into a state championship game that he ended the call with an I love you. Looking forward to that tonight. In the meantime, Time. Katie may have a significant lead over Cedar Hill at the break. Do not count out the Longhorns, though, Ted. Yeah, I think for Cedar Hill, you got to go out there and you got to get yourself a third manageable. Okay, you got to go out there and get in third and two and let Caden Salter create out on out on the edge. Get him out in space and let him cook. He's your best player. He can lead a comeback. You've also got to find a way to stop giving up those big chunk plays on the ground to Katie because that's what's really killing him. It's the saga we all love. Fourth meeting in nine seasons between these two. Cedar Hill having taken back Back to back in 2013 and 2014. Can Katie even the slate? Or will Cedar Hill prevent? Second half is next on Fox Sports Southwest. Enjoy. 
A most impressive first half for the Katy Tigers. The Tigers who are searching for the school's ninth state football championship halfway there. They're up 24-0 on the Cedar Hill Longhorns. Halftime of the 6A Division II state championship. Craig Way, Gary Reasons with you. And like we said, lots of things that have to impress you with what Katie did in the first half. Well, first of all, they came out and they played exceptional football offensively. Everything they've done is done right. Defensively, they have basically shut out this football team that they're opposing today. They only have allowed five first downs in this ball game, and their defense has shut them out on all of their third down conversion attempts. It's been a great defense performance for Katie as well. Well, we look at our Texas Farm Bureau Insurance game summary of the first half, and the summary of this is Katie dominance both on the ground and through the air and defensively. A very complete effort. Well, whenever you have this offense and they're humming, their run game goes, and that means that these running backs, Seth Davis, Jalen Davis, they both have the ability to run balls through this defense, and this offense has done a great job of opening up those holes, and that's exactly what has happened here for KD. They have set the table here. They have scored numerous times, and they have done execution-wise. They have done everything that has been written in the playbook, and then some. Even getting the fullback in the ball game here for a touchdown. The passing game, the play-action passing game is working. Everything is going the the way of the Katy Tigers right now. So how does Cedar Hill flip the script here and try to make this a second half of Longhorn football? We'll see if that happens. Yeah, the question is, what can they do against Katy? Why don't we ask Katy? Katy <laughs> Engelson, who's down there with uh, Longhorn's head coach, Carlos Lynn. Coach Lynn, earlier this week, you said a key was to shut down Katie's run game. What's the number one adjustment your team needs to make in terms of your run defense? Well, we got to do a little bit better job of fitting. You know, we, we're there sometimes, sometimes we're there. Got to be consistent in our fits, got to tackle. And, uh, you know, they're doing a good job of, uh, of, of scheming us as well. So we've made some adjustments. Hopefully this half we'll be able to slow them down just a little bit more. Thanks, Coach Lynn. Absolutely. Katie, thank you. I think Carlos Lynn put it very, very well, Gary. He said they've schemed us well. Yeah. But, well, we've got to slow things down a little bit. And you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, talking about fit, you know, the defense, that's that's what the fit is. The fit is you've got to be, you've got to do your job. As a defensive player, don't do too much. Don't try to overrun or do things because it, it creates gaps or holes. That's probably what he's talking to his, to his players about. Do your job, get your fit, and, and show up. Now they're going to have to go out there on defense here and slow down a, a very potent KD offense here to open this third quarter. Cedar Hill to kick it off. The Longhorns William Rhodes to kick it. And an onside kick to begin the second half. Loose, flagged down. It might have been touched before going 10 yards. Longhorns had come up with a ball, but the question was, did they touch it before it went 10 yards? And that might have been the reason the flag came. And we'll see how this all unfolds here. The ball was in the hands of Cedar Hill at the end here, but we'll see what happens. Is there illegal contact? Is the ball touched? Yes, it touches a, a Cedar Hill player prior to the ball being recovered by Cedar Hill. So that is illegal touching on the kicking team. And rolls right up the foot there. That player can't see his number, but uh, yeah, those things happen. He's trying to block the only player available to come get that football out of the way, and that's Davis doing that block, and the ball hits him on his on his back foot. Well, they're still discussing it right now. Lance Mathis, the referee of this Tyler Base chapter, to explain it. The question is. Was the, the block coming up or was that initiated by Cedar Hill? Because if a KD player comes up and engages there in the block to take him out of play, then it becomes a live ball again. That's, that'll be the case. The question here, what they're discussing, and we're about to have the, uh, the announcement coming from Lance Bathis. What illegal blocking on the kicking team, number 81. That penalty is declined. Katie will take the ball at the illegal touching spot. And there it is. It came from the Cedar Hill side coming in to take out the man. Jalen James was the man who illegally engaged the Tiger here. 
And yeah. as a result, Katie with excellent field position. Yeah, we take a look at what Katie has done offensively with their possessions. They've done a pretty good job of maintaining control. Four of those five drives they've got, they've resulted in points. So excellent job here by Katie when they've had the ball offensively. And they start to hit as we start the third quarter here with their possession. And Tigers go right back to the ground to Jalen Davis. And Charles Esters made the tackle. You know, we've made mention of this sophomore quarterback, Caleb Coger. Pretty impressive here in the first half with the play action passing game that he's worked four of six passing. Not throwing it a lot, but very effective when he has. The, the balls have been on target. We saw the one touchdown pass there. That was a kind of a combination of plays and what they've seen of what they've done on previous work and got a nice touchdown pass. Again to the ground, again to Jalen Davis, pounding off that right side before Marion Williams can wrap him up for Cedar Hill. You know, one of the things that Cedar Hill, I think, could do better in this ball game is to align themselves a little bit closer and then go to slant uh, slant their defensive line, uh, defensive line and get into the backfield and create a negative play. So if you get into the backfield, you disrupt the timing of the pulling guards, the pulling tackles, the leading fullbacks. You've got to find somebody to break up just to disrupt that type of timing. Otherwise, you're going to have a long day on the defensive side of the ball. On third and three. Again, the play action from Cogart. Downfield flags coming down. The pass incomplete. The intended target was the tight end. Emilio Silva who was locked up. And there's a lot of contact between him and uh, the defender there, so we'll see how they how they how they call this. Whether it's going to be something pushing off by Silva as we throw this out there, no, that's definitely holding on the offense defensive player there. That's Brett Lynch, the senior safety. Pass interference. Defense number six. It's a 15-yard penalty from the previous spot. Automatic first down. And the ball's in the air, so it is pass interference and not allowing him to make make movement towards the football, so he's pulling him away, essentially, and penalty moves the chains here for, uh, for Katie. So down to the 27-yard line off the penalty, and Tigers on the march again. Penalty on the onside kick, giving... Katie, the football at the Cedar Hill 49. Penalty on the pass interference. And back to the ground. And Jalen Davis trying to pound forward. You heard Gary Joseph say going in at the half, he said they've got a good defensive front. We've got to do a little bit better job of creating things. And we've seen them break free, although they've used deception really well when they're lining up going, uh, just pounding at them. It's been a pretty good battle in the trench there. Yeah, so what happens is that on these explosive plays that they've been able to handle, they've been able to take their wide receivers who normally come inside like they're blocking the linebacker level, then they angle back out to the flag, and that, that has been open here against this Cedar Hill defense on a couple of occasions. Let's see if they go back to that work. Yep, so the younger Davis, this time Seth Davis, this time Cedar Hill ready for it. So now no gain on the play, Jalen Wilson on the tackle. Yeah, that's the that's the example of a downhill play. Get in the line of scrimmage, get a negative play, go ahead and create something there, and Wilson does a good job of getting through the line of scrimmage and making a tackle. So now you come up on third down for Katie, and they've done an excellent job in key situations on third down. They have third and five here. Cover. Again, wide open Salisbury. The catch and a first down. Nice open field tackle by Kendall Stevens, but the catch already made a 10-yard pickup and a first down. So the defense is in a dilemma. Whether you cover the short receiver or the deep receiver, they've now adjusted to cover the deep receiver on this route. Watch on the top of your screen. You see the deep receiver back there? That's why he they covered him up, who had the touchdown previously. Now the underneath receiver is open for the first down. An easy throw by Coger. Just a little adjustment there defensively by, by Cedar Hill. They've picked up the deep, and they've gone deep to short. And, and that's another example, Gary, of the composure of the sophomore. Cover, take what's there and go ahead and not try to force anything. Exactly. First and 10 now from the 11. Jalen Davis stumbling forward. A gain of four down to the seven-yard line. Maybe even five yards closer to the six. You know, we talked about the offensive line a little bit in the first half, and you don't run this type of an offense without guys that have bought into the physicality and the ability to just get your do your job and, and work together up there as a unit. They've got pulling guards, pulling tackles, pulling centers that sometimes, depending upon the defensive front, just to get onto the right blocking scheme. These guys have done a tremendous job here against the Cedar Hill front today. 
second down and five. And again, all play action. There's Cover. And too much on it. Was looking for Silva, the tight end. Yeah, he's got to stick that ball on him. That's a ball that he says, hey, give me that one back. I'll put it on him. He's got a receiver, Silva, coming across the back of the end zone, and he just needs to put that on his numbers instead of sailing it out there. Just, just zip it. You know, this is a young quarterback, and he's just trying to float it in there. Just put it on him. He has that touchdown. That's one he can learn from. So another third down coming up for Katie. Where the Tigers have been so efficient. Seven out of nine, Gary, on third down of the Tigers today. And on third and five, to the ground to Davis. Won't pick up the first down there. Only a gain of a couple to the four. Yeah, does Coach Joseph go for it here on uh, fourth down or bring on the field goal team? Likely the field goal opportunity is going to be out there. Look to extend the lead. We saw Demonja Lozic hit a 48-yarder. Late in the first half, this one just barely beyond the length of an extra point. Yeah, a 21 that, yard try. And that 48 yarder would have been good from 55, is, is my guess. He had a heck of a heck of a lot of it trajectory on that on that kick. This kick makes it 27 to nothing, Katie. Seven and a half to go third quarter here in the 6A Division II state championship. Tigers extending their lead. The UIL Football State Championships are brought to you by your local Texas Ford dealer. Ford is the best in Texas. Texas Farm Bureau Insurance, proud official sponsor of the UIL. Baylor Scott and White Health, changing health care for the better. Main event, make every moment the main event. And Jack in the Box, proud sponsor of the UIL Championships. Welcome back to AT&T Stadium for the 6A Division II state title game. Katie leading Cedar Hill 27-0. And senior wide receiver Taylor Salisbury, a big catch on that last Katie Tiger drive. And I'm sitting actually right in front of Taylor's family. They're right here. And after his first touchdown in the first half, pure elation from this group. His mom nearly speechless. She told me right after that score, Taylor didn't play tackle football until about seventh grade, but he's super dedicated. He loves this game he's now a captain of this team and after that score he made his way to the sideline made sure to look at his 12 year old brother right there make sure to acknowledge him and wave to him a very heartfelt moment so a lot of fun over here for the Salisbury family guys no doubt Lauren there's another look at the play there to Salisbury no doubt about it Salisbury did a great job there and make a huge play a couple of times here in his ball game now for Salisbury and uh, getting a touchdown in a state championship game that, that's pretty good stuff Helps set up the field goal to make it 27 to nothing. <laughs> Salisbury enjoying the moment. Angled kickoff and a fair catch right there. Salisbury is senior, came in having caught 17 passes for 429 yards and eight touchdowns today. Almost a fifth of that total right there, and averaging Gary just inside of 20 yards per catch. That's not. That's a good number. Anytime you're up in that 20, 20 yards per per reception plateau, that means you're an explosive type receiver, and those are ones you like to have on your football team. First opportunity for Cedar Hill with the football in the second half. I'd like to see what kind of adjustments they've made, and how can they take a little bit off the plate of Caden Salter? They're asking a lot of this young man. They've got to put some help to him there, and they can start him with his run game. Yeah, that's where they go on first down with the run from Anthony Thomas IV, the senior. And they're having Gary to rotate a lot of guys. They, you know, Thomas is an inside receiver, a slot receiver, and, you know, again, being a man down and a key man down in the uh, ground game is really brought about the necessity for some creativity. There. Yeah, with Kevin Young not being in this ball game, you know, him being lost after the eighth game of the season, it's really put a damper on this football team to be able to get yardage from the line of scrimmage in a running game, but here they go. And once more, it's Thomas. And a first down. Well, that means that the offensive line has found a way to, to find to get a hole in there, and that's some adjustments they made at halftime. Maybe the splits are different. Maybe it's a little cross or, cross or angle block. Good job here bringing him inside and getting that yardage, so 
excellent job there open up on the on this uh, third quarter of getting some first downs up to the Katie 48 that's the first play of the afternoon Gary that went for 20 or more something Cedar Hills used to doing back to the ground yet again this time the Tiger defense gets in the ball came out picked up by Hamilton McMartin down the sidelines picked up a block and he'll bring it back the distance for a touchdown for Gady. Hamilton McMartin on a fumble return of 54 yards. Well, it just seems to be the day of the Katy Tigers here in AT&T Stadium in Arlington. And physical tackling, everything that they're doing there is going the way here. So you see the, the run here and the cause fumble coming inside out there. That was one of the linebackers. That was, was that Jaden Maroney? Did he make that contact? Or was that Dal Dalton Johnson coming in from the safety spot, causing a fumble there? Katie gets it right back. Separated the ball loose. Big Martin right there. Pick it up on the hop and return it for the score. Big Martin was the guy who fell on the ball that they thought was a fumble in the first quarter. It was overturned. Here's another look. We'll take a look at here in the cost fumble. This sure is. That is Dalton Johnson, 43, coming in. And McMartin does pick that ball up and, and brings it to the house. Wow, what a great memory. Scoop and score for a touchdown in a state championship game. That well, was Jaden Callahan on the carry. And again, that was another receiver, Gary, that Carlos Lynn is having to rotate receivers to help carry the load in terms of the ground attack. And it started off well enough on this drive. But uh, it ends up being 55-yard Return for the touchdown officially. And Katie extends the lead to 34-0. You know, throughout the end of the season here, they put a lot on this quarterback, Caden Salter, and, and, and with good reason, because he's a talented player. He can run, he can throw it, he's dynamic. We talked about his numbers, 2,500 yards passing, over 1,000 yards rushing on the season. He's done that. But here in this environment against Katie in the state championship game, you need to have some balance, and, and that's what that's what Coach Lynn's trying to create there, getting some running balance and not putting all of that pressure on, on Caden Salter. And you know, they put a lot on his plate. They says that he eats it up, and one of the things they say about him, he's got a superpower. His superpower is turning bad plays into, in, into positive plays, and hasn't happened today so far for, for, uh, for this offense. And this young man's had a tough day to, to, to work with this offense with Caden Salter. You know, Carlos Lynn is saying this is not the team we've been most of the year in terms of the mistakes and the inability to get anything consistent established because throughout the course of the season, Cedar Hill has been really, really good. Their uh, only loss was to Duncanville, of course, who was beaten by South Lake Carroll in the state semifinal round last week in the 6A Division I bracket. And Carlos Lynn's Offensive scheme is spread it out. Of course, there's three state titles going back several years, and there, see what they were able to do along the way. We had to go overtime to beat an outstanding Rockwall Heat team. Coached by Mike Spradlin, and then overcoming Rodney Webb's Denton Geyer Ball Club to win in the state semifinal. To the ground, Anthony Thomas again. He had a couple of nice carries the first time. Now, Katie looking for whoever's getting their hands on the football, be it a receiver or running back. And Cal Varner in on the stop again, along with Shepard Bowling. Yeah, but I think they've got to maintain this type of, me uh, of a methodology. You've got to put the ball in the hands of playmakers, whether it's inside or outside. And these are the, the playmakers that have caught balls from Salter as well as run the balls throughout this second half of the season. And that's who they are right now. It's not the, not the team that they had at week seven or week eight. Salter to the air this time and dragging across the middle for the catch and out to the 29 yard line is Jalen JBN Clemmer. Yeah, I haven't heard his name spoken quite a bit here and Clemmer is one of those guys that had a catch early in the ball game but now getting a ball on a crossing route hasn't been able to get the ball to him here throughout this uh, this ball game hopefully he can give them a glimmer of hope when he catches that football. Third and six for Cedar Hill. And Salter going deep, and he has a man open, but just a little too much on it. Was trying to connect with Jaden Moore, who definitely had a step 
on the Katy secondary, but it's been that kind of afternoon for the long run. Yeah, I think that actually actually was a little bit surprising to Salter, seeing his receiver as wide open as he was down there, and he just had a little bit too much on it as he steps into this ball and throws it and gets it out a little bit too far for him, un unable to, to pull it in as more. Another punt coming from Cedar Hill. And it's going to be a fake. Fake punt up the middle, and this is going to work for a first down and a lot more. Down the sidelines, this is Kylan Ashton. Ashton inside the five-yard line. It'll be first and goal. Antonio Silva wrapped him up. It's a 67-yard run on the fake punt by Kylan Ashton. Well, snap it to the fullback. This is Kylan Ashton. He is one of their backup running backs in this ball game, and he's carried the football for this team, not in a large capacity, but here, watch, he just snaps a direct snap to him, and they've got cross-blocking there, and he takes it right up the middle of the field and shows that he's got explosive speed here. Good job in pursuit by Katie and not allowing him to get to the end zone. Otherwise, this is a score on a, on, a, on a punt formation. It will be first and goal at the four. Salter hurries his team out there, but they may not get the playoff in time. They didn't. The offense, of course, was gathering. Remember, it was a time fake out. punt. Cedar Hill, that's their first and a half. All right, so the Longhorns take the time out to avoid the uh, delay penalty. But that's also the challenge, Gary, with the special teams on that 67-yard run to get all of the offensive guys back on the field and ready to go. Longhorns take a timeout, and then they'll have first and goal at four. Get a look downfield at our sky cam, driven by Blue Cross, Blue Shield of Texas. It'll be first and goal Cedar Hill at the Katie four-yard line. And let's go down to the Cedar Hills highlighter, our Katie Engelson. Thank you, Craig. Well, football is a family affair for Cedar Hill head football coach Carlos Lynn. His son, Caleb, is a 16-year-old junior at Cedar Hill, and he is on the sidelines watching his dad today. His story is one of perseverance and faith. He is a two-time cancer survivor. At the age of eight, he received his first diagnosis, undergoing many weeks of chemotherapy before going into remission. In 2017, the same year, Coach Lynn returned to Cedar Hill, but as the head coach, the cancer returned, and it was it required a more aggressive approach. It included a 16 and a half hour surgery and over 30 weeks of chemotherapy. Coach Lynn told me the biggest thing he has learned from Caleb was his ability to remain confident, saying he didn't get rattled, emphasizing his faith through it all and his strength, saying he is his superhero and he's got him and his wife Antoinette so much. Thank you, Katie. It's a fabulous story. As Katie mentioned, a perseverance there by the Lynn family. And really a growth moment together for Cedar Hill as a program to get behind Coach Lynn, his son, and, and, and you know all of they went that they went through it. And he, they, those, this team has lived that experience with that family, and it's a great outcome. And glad to see the young man doing well here at this football game and being a but being a part of that football team. Those are one of the stories about Texas high school football that really are endearing. First and goal of the four. Salter looking to either throw or run and has to get rid of the ball, threw it away. Well, this is critical go time here. If you have any chance whatsoever of getting back in this football game, you have got to put points on the board here. More importantly, a touchdown as we see a, a offensive lineman go down here. You know, they're thin at the offensive line, Craig. One of the things we, we hadn't mentioned here, Carlos Peoples, number 74, Injury was time injured. On the field was injured a week ago against Denton Geyer, and he is not able to play in this ball game. So they've had to shuffle some players up front of that offensive line. So they cannot afford to lose offensive linemen here as they've got to, got to shuffle in right here because of a, a stoppage for, with Massey going out on a play with uh, with him coming up a little, a little lame. So to be second at goal for the four, Jake Moore was well covered by Bobby Taylor, the junior corner. Matches up against him again. Chris Allen in the backfield. He's offset. And Al Salter under a lot of pressure. Again, can only get rid of it. A lot of heat coming from Shepard Bowling. 
from his outside linebacker spot. Yeah, what a great job of doing that with bowling and his speed and just keeping up with Salter. It's, <laughs> it's gamesmanship there. And, you know, who's going to flinch? But bowling just took it right to the quarterback and did a great job of forcing him to throw something that he didn't want to throw. And critical third down here. This is two down territory, undoubtedly, here for, for Cedar Hill. Get this ball in the end zone is, is your goal, your objective. And they've had to they've looked to throw and roll roll the quarterback here. Let's see what they do here on third down. Third down for Cedar Hill, where the Longhorns have struggled today. 0 for 6, no longer now. Caden Salter saw an opening and charged into the end zone to get Cedar Hill on the board. Well, I believe this is a quarterback draw all the way. They flood the field to the far side, the wide side of the field, and he pumps really heavily. But watch the line on the left side of the line here. They're blocking down. So this is run all the way, Craig, and it's a quarterback draw. Salter reads it perfectly, executes it, and it's a great uh, job here getting this ball in the end zone after the turnover. A conversion attempt from William Rhodes. Kick is good, and so Cedar Hill on the board, 34 to 7. Cedar Hill had a grand total of 76 yards of offense in the first half. That's a 75-yard touchdown drive as we go back down to the Longhorn sideline to Katie. Cedar Hill quarterback Caden Salter putting his team on the board there with that touchdown, and he is playing in his first ever state championship game. And in just four days, he will be attending his first college classes. Next week, Salter will be moving to Knoxville, Tennessee to enroll early at the University of Tennessee, where he will be taking his talents. Needless to say, a, a busy week for the Cedar Hill quarterback. Yeah. Thank you, Katie. And we saw that last night yeah. with uh, Seth Hennigan for for Denton Ryan leading the state title. He's in a car right now, probably <laughs> headed for Memphis. Well, maybe they could carpool, you know, going out to Tennessee. You never know. It uh, could share on some expenses there. <laughs> 67 of One going to Memphis, one going to Tennessee. It's pretty yeah. good stuff. Yeah. It's another six hours uh, beyond there, but they could drop off Seth, and then uh, from there, uh, Keaton on the Knoxville. 67 yards of that 75 on the Jack in the Box scoring drive coming off the, the fake punt run by Kylan Ashton. A drive cap on the touchdown run by Salter. Well, I'm sure they feel a little bit better about themselves now after putting points on the board. That's got to be a little lift to uh, the Cedar Hill football team. So he's got to make more opportunities, create them those opportunities for this team to kind of even get back in this thing. Another onside kick, but it didn't get the second hop they wanted easily recovered by the Tigers. And Nice job on the recovery by Aiden McKinney. Yeah, nothing wrong with going for the onside kick here. Whether it's a short field or not, you've got to get possessions, possessions, possessions. Get the ball back in any way that you can. As you see one kicker go by and another one comes through, <laughs> that's exactly what happened. But a good, uh, good job on the recovery. Yeah, McKinney stepping up, not allowing him to take that second hop. And so once more, Katie starts the Cedar Hill side of midfield. Their third drive to start in Longhorn territory in the toss to the sophomore Seth Davis. Here he goes. Davis trying to cut inside back. A nice first down run. Takes it to the 28-yard line. 21-yard rumble for Seth Davis. You know, that's not easy to do, and that is to set the corner and win the corner with the wide receivers on the outside blocking. And good job of blocking in the lead block there, as you see going low blocking on the front on the front side of that and Davis the benefactor of that with a huge game Tyron Bird stayed at home to be able to wrap him up for the tackle but Katie on the move again Isaiah Smith and a good block on the outside number 26 here he goes again and here goes Coger again okay. now feel too much on this one he was looking for four shirts shirts was pretty well covered too yeah, that's the play-action pass game that we talked about. Katie executing very well in the first half. This young sophomore quarterback, that's his best trait per coach Gary Joseph, and he's done a nice job of it today. So second down and 10. Nick Anderson and Taylor Salisbury, the receivers at the bottom of your screen. Salisbury's in the slot. But from the eye, it's back. To Davis, Seth, the sophomore, plunge forward for a pickup of five. Stephen Ingram, Charles Esters, a stop for Cedar Hill. 
When you look at this defense for, for Cedar Hill, you know, you look at the defensive line with what they've got makeup up there with Dyson and Esters on the outside, Wilson, Massey inside. That That is an imposing defensive front, but the will and the execution of what Katie has done today is kind of overtaken, you know, that, that, that part of their defense that they really shine, have shined with over the course of the season. A little bit different style of offense than they see in a week-in, week-out basis in this in this part of the country or, or the state. But uh, the defense trying to trying to hold them out here on the with this drive. Well, going into that, Katie was seven out of ten on third down. However, Jalen Davis was stopped after a gain only of a couple. So now it is fourth down, and again a glance to the sideline and Gary Joseph. He may take this, this play clock all the way down yep. and call a timeout is likely what will happen here. Trying to work the clock here in this third quarter and try to maximize possessions. I think we'll see probably Coach Joseph use the timeout and then look for another field goal from Lonsick. So the timeout called. 2.23 to go here timeout. in Katie. the third quarter. That's their first in the second half. We mentioned earlier this is the fourth time these teams have met in the state championship in the last nine years. They had three consecutive years when they were doing it. Katie, in 2012, was looking to add to its trophy collection. Adam Taylor ran for 277 yards and five touchdowns. Katie won that one 35-24. Very next year, 2013, the Longhorns looking to even it up. DeMarcus Lodge, a big factor in this one, showing off the move, 62 yards to the touchdown. Cedar Hill rallied back from down 10 to win 34-24. And then the rubber match in 2014. Again, DeMarcus Lodge would be the difference. An incredible catch right there. Goes 63 yards in for the score. Cedar Hill making it back-to-back -back wins. Joey McGuire and the Longhorns captured that state title in 2014. And now, Katie looking to make it two and two in all-time matchups. 38-yard field goal try. That one by Lasik is good, and it tacks on three more to the Katie Tiger total. So it's a 37 to seven lead for Katie here late in the third quarter. We mentioned the Tigers are going for their ninth state championship. Most recent was five years ago. They won the 6A Division II crown over Lake Travis down at NRG Stadium in Houston. You go all the way back, Gary, 1959 when they won a 1A state championship over sundown <laughs> from the Pan Am. It'll beat them 16 to six to win that one. The modern era ushered in by the Hall of Famer Mike Johnston yeah, the state look, titles. Yeah, just look at the, in the 1950s, you know, you look at Katy itself, the city just basically 25, 30 miles on the west side of Houston. How that community has expanded and grown. Houston has grown out to Katy, essentially, and it has pretty much uh, taken over out there. And it's a great community, and it's one where this program has continued to shine and grow, and they've had great players come through that program over the years, and, and also the coaching staff has been, has been exceptional. Yeah, it's now all a part of uh, the metropolis of Houston. <laughs> is that what they Katie call it now? <laughs> the megalopolis of the whole Harris County and then uh, Fort Bend County neighboring and other counties as well in the greater Houston area. Lazic to kick it off again. Another directional high kickoff so as to limit the return. And it does just that. And Cedar Hill will get it across the 30, but it is able to do that. And you know, Namaja Lasik also has done a, a very solid job today hitting the three field goals, which ties a 6A state championship record for most in the ball game. He's done that as well. He's done his job. Yeah, he certainly has. And I think he could, if you ask him to kick that ball out of the end zone, he could do that on a regular basis. And he's got a powerful leg. He's got to obviously good execution when he's kicking field goals. And the lengthy field goal kick that he kicked here today was impressive. 48 yarder and bright future for that young man. Cedar Hill able to get the touchdown run from Salter following the 67 yard run on the punt, the fake punt run by Kyla Nashton. Chris Allen's in the backfield now and on 
keeping it himself is going to be Salter upfield. Only able to reclaim the line of scrimmage, nothing more. And just kind of a quarterback automatic draw right there. Just uh, trying to look to the outside. Both receivers seem like they're going to streak up the field, but that's really a quarterback run play all the way. Defensively, they just kind of shut that down pretty quickly. I've been impressed with this KD defensive front. They have done a nice job against anything that Cedar Hill has, has tried to deploy out there. They have they have played and played hard and physical. They've, they've changed where the line of scrimmage is played, Craig. He's more in the backfield of Cedar Hill. Now Salter stepping back and thrown deep. Does have a man. That one is caught by Anthony Thomas. The deep shot works for the Longhorns for the first time today. And they'll take it all the way down inside the KD 20-yard line. It'll go for 48 yards. Well, when we talked to Coach Joseph, he talked about one defensive key. He says we can't let them get a step. Well, what that means is that these explosive receivers, you can't let them get a step of separation as they run down the field. And that's exactly what happened with Anthony Thomas and his speed. Got a step on the defense, and Salter delivered with the football. Spotted at the 20, and that's where Cedar Hill will stay because Thomas that time took a hard lick right after he caught the pass from Carson Marshall, the junior outside linebacker. Yeah, but with that long pass, they flipped the field here. You see the confidence growing, I think, here with Cedar Hill. Hey, this is more us. This is more what we're normally able to do. Let's just keep churning these things out. And it's kind of like a little little machine as the thing trying to kind of gets a little more, a little hot, a little heat. It works more efficiently. Over the middle, that one tipped and almost picked off. Shepard Bowling almost had his second interception of the day. Brian Rainey couldn't hold it. Yeah, unfortunate there for Rainey. He's usually sure-handed. I believe that's the second ball that he's dropped today. So Rainey, you know, not helping his quarterback and his football team by, by securing that grab. And as you said, Craig, almost a miscue here with that potential of being intercepted. Cedar Hill's only third down conversion came on the touchdown run last drive by Salter. They're one out of seven. With a lot of pressure coming. Over the middle and a nice grab made right at the marker by Clemmer. And in fact, it's enough for the first down. I, I will tell you this. Cedar Hill's offensive line did not block anybody. <laughs> what? Just what? There, there was none blocked. It wasn't even a screen play. But they were all in the face. And, and Caden Salter, he did that on his own to complete that pass to, to, to Clemmer. Exceptional job. You see the four white jerseys? Man. And Gary, you mentioned how shorthanded the Cedar Hill offensive front is. As a result of the injuries, now first and goal from the 10. in the backfield with Salter. And Salter, the design run himself, Caden Salter, outside, inside for the touchdown. Salter able to make it back-to-back -back rushing scores for the Longhorns. Well, this is good execution here. You get a, a big chunk play, go down the field, get in the positive territory, and then you just execute. And that's what Caden Salter does here. He executes, gets behind the big fella, and then makes the, the next five yards on his own with his athleticism. And that's what he's done all season long for, for Cedar Hill. And no surprise here that he can make that play here in the third quarter. So touchdowns on the last two drives for the Longhorns. Rhodes extra point kick makes it a 37 to 14 ball game with seven seconds remaining in the third quarter. And like you said, after the first touchdown, feeling a little bit better yep. about themselves and probably feeling like you're in a little more of a rhythm now. Yeah, a little bit of a rhythm. You know that your stuff, the things that your coaches are telling you, they're starting to work. And, and that young man specifically is getting a little bit more confidence in, the, in his game and trying to fill in the juices flow and let them go. Now it's the defense's turn to continue the pressure, stop Katie, get the ball back to the offense. It's just that normal cycle that we always talk about. You know, defense, you can help your offense by getting off, getting the off, other offense on the field and getting your team back out there. And, and that's how the momentum game of football usually works. You know, Gary, in the first six possessions of this game, Cedar Hill had zero plays of 20 yards or more. In their last three possessions, they've had three. Explosive plays are usually the catalyst for successful drives. There's no doubt about that. That's the that's the way that you do things. Big chunk plays, and then you just kind of chip away then continually, and they're able to do that. They've got the talent to, you know, to claw back and get back in this football game. It is still a large deficit here, 23 points in this ball game, but I wouldn't count this uh, the Cedar Hill team out yet. Well, they've tried onside kicks the last two times. 
It's all about possessions, Craig. I, I, I wouldn't surprise me to see another one here. They get that second hop on the kick, which they've been unable to do, and credit Katie for doing an excellent job of positioning themselves to field the onside kicks. <laughs> Roach started to go left. Now he'll look to go right. Here it is. There's the second bounce, but again, Katie able to do an excellent job. That's Dalton Johnson, who's headed for the University of Arizona, hopping on that football off that second hop. Yeah, there is, and then there's a Cedar Hill player down who made the contact and the tackle on that uh, recovery. It was a pretty good collision that time as he did make that tackle. Yeah, they'll continue to take a close look at him. Carlos Lynn talking about it with his kicker, William Rhodes. You know, uniquely, uh, Carlos Lynn, we talked to him and about him, he, he's an ordained minister. You know, that, that's one of the unique calling cards that he has to be able to speak eloquently to his kids and really on a faith-based level. He, and it's it, it impressive with what he does with his young men and how he leads them. You see the contact here in the tackle. That was a very physical tackle. Hopefully he's okay. That's more. Jaden Moore making that play. Well, that's interesting you bring that up. It, you know, here's Carlos, who's an ordained minister, and he said, you know, that night before that 1990 state championship game, he said, he said, Coach Woods was a disciplinarian. If he knew what <laughs> we were doing, he said all the kids were out running around 10-degree weather outside, just having fun down by the Brazos River. He said he would not have been happy, but they went out and played a whale of a game the next day and won the 4A state championship. Sweep into the right side, and Seth Davis on the carry. A good first down carry on the final play of the third quarter. Katie has won eight state championships. They're 12 minutes away from the school's ninth. Kate Salter able to get a couple of touchdown runs in the third quarter, but it's Katie up 37-14 at the end of the third quarter of a 6A Division II state championship. We welcome you back to AT&T Stadium in Arlington, the final quarter of the UIL 6A Division II State Football Championship. Katie with a 37-14 lead on Cedar Hill. Craig Way, Gary Reasons, Warren Blackwell, Katie Engelson, and our entire crew here from the home of the Dallas Cowboys. As you look at the main event player comparison, Jalen Davis and Seth Davis, <laughs> pick which one you want. They're both doing a fine job today. They really are. They've been the one-two punch here for this Katy football team running the football all season long and we talked about them at the top of the show over 3,000 yards combined. They're not disappointing here in the state championship game. Uh, you know, one, one player has a touchdown, Jalen, the senior, as it, as it probably should be of the two brothers. He's got to give him a, a touchdown in his in his final game here as a, as a high school player. It's the younger brother, Seth, who's on the field right now on second down and two and there goes Seth Davis. He'll have a first down for Katie. Yeah, we talked about uh, the younger player, Seth Davis, here. And, and obviously, he's got a lot of ability, a lot of speed. I, you're almost a little jump cut action right there. And like the ability of that young man and his brother as well. Both of them have just been a fun to watch here. And when you research the Katie Tigers, you know, you don't have to look too much too far as to where they get the bulk of their offense. And it's through the running game and those two young men. Ten-yard carry. For Seth Davis, it's at the Cedar Hill 34. And now to Seth again. Picked up one big block and turns it in the alley and nearly another 10 yards. They'll settle for nine. Jalen Wilson, the tackle for Cedar Hill. You know, when you have this blocking style, this is an unselfish football team, Craig. And the offensive line are asked to do a lot of the dirty work, and really when you're having to roll out and cut block and throw your body around, that is unselfish play. And, you know, we talk about the running backs being, you know, being the catalyst here and being big runs, but it's all done by this offensive line. There's no doubt about that. And they have done an exceptional job here today of helping these running backs get those holes open and giving them an opportunity to make these explosive plays. Out of the eye on second down and one. And under center, Coger. The hand again to Seth Davis. Now, younger brother joins older brother in the end zone. 25-yard touchdown run. I see what you can do. Now I'm going to go do. That's exactly what happened there. This is just excellent job. You see the backside guard pull, and he gets in behind that block, and 
there's just a little crease there and sometimes running backs have vision and have the ability to kind of maneuver through there and this is what he does great job that time by Seth Davis of finding the hole exploiting it and he wasn't even touched on his route to the end zone Losick for the extra point and Katie just like that back up 30 here half minute into this final quarter to make it 44 to 14. Does anybody touch him as he goes through the hole here? I don't think he was even touched by anyone in route there. I mean, the safety just kind of whiffed at him. That was an excellent job of blocking execution. And then you have a running back who's as talented as this young player is. It's exceptional. You know, we mentioned that Cedar Hill on its first six drives had no plays of 20 or more yards, and they've had three in their last three possessions. That, for Katie, was their sixth play of 20 or more yards. And they're primarily a running team. They've had a few explosive passing plays here in this ballgame today, but their running game, they give them those chunk yards plays, Craig. You know, you know, explosive plays, 15 or 20, depending upon what type of, of you know team you are, you kind of calculate those things. Those are things that coaches look for as game changing. And those are trend setting for your offense and being able to give you big chunk plays and set up situations in a football game. And those big plays lead to points. And that's exactly what has happened. Katie striking right back to push that margin back out to 30. An offensive line happy with itself for good reason. Yeah, so far in this ball game, Katie, 264 yards rushing on the ground today. So they have imposed their will on the Cedar Hill football team, which is a very good defensive football team. And a lot of talent on that side of the ball. Deep kickoff for a change. That one from the five yard line. And breaking it out of the 20 to the 25 yard line, Jalen Peoples. And Cedar Hill once more will start at the 25. Will it score and score quick here? If you're going to get any hope of getting back into this football game, you can't trade scores here with a, with a powerful Katy football team. You've got to be able to score and separate and get a deep get a, get a defensive stop so but i think cedar hill's got to put the gas pedal down craig they've got to find ways to get you know big chunk plays here to, to even claw their way back in this just a little bit more from the 26 salter sets up the screen it's picked A defensive lineman's dream. Wow. Here in the state championship game, Cal Varner goes in the backfield, and the quarterback, Caden Salter, is thinking he's going to throw a nice, easy little screen pass to one of his running backs coming across the line of but behind the, the line of scrimmage. But big number 91 says, I'm going to step right in front of that. I'm going to take this ball. So watch on the left side of your screen. Number 91 come into your screen there, and boom, he's there where he's expecting the running back to be. Just an errant throw there and a decision that he just <laughs> he doesn't have the ability to get the ball outside to his receiver. And Varner makes one heck of a play as a big rangy defensive lineman. And Gary, I'm not sure that Caden Salter was ready for the snap. It looked like it took him by surprise and then tried to get the pass off. The extra point kick makes it 51 to 14. But uh, that snap may have come before Caden Salter was ready. We'll get another look at it yeah, here, Gary. It did come a little bit early. He's still looking. He's trying to get somebody to move, and one of his players is coming across. That's who he's trying to throw it to. But Varner's right there in the way. And he Watch his face. I'm sure his eyes don't even see Varner. If you take a look at the left side of his helmet, you hear him going to say, he's not even looking that way. He's just tossing it to where he's expecting his back to be. So another difficult uh, moment there for Cedar Hill. Opportunistic moment there for the Katy Tiger defense. The senior defensive end, Cal Varner, scoring on that play. You know, this has been a defensive effort that's been pretty exceptional here. You've got an explosive offense. One of the best in the state with uh, with Caden Salter at the helm. They've been able to put up points on pretty much anybody that they have played. But uh, not to be the case here. Not an explosive day in, against this uh Katie defense. They've done a nice job here. They've had some opportunity. They've done had some things go against them. The defense here in the third quarter with Cedar Hill fighting back a little bit. But again, they raise, you know, they show what the kind of muster they have as a defensive unit with the interception for a touchdown. Well, it looked 
looked like a fair catch. Ball was made. That's what the Katie coaches are are uh, requesting. The officials make that call. Cindy Allen caught it. He ends up going to the 26-yard line anyway, so that is where Cedar Hill will operate. It's time for our Baylor Scott White health game diagnosis. Well, this is all about turnovers here. Defensively, they've done a good job of stepping in front of plays and making plays. Interception there, and this is a cause fumble, and you pick that up and you bring it to the house. That's a big play for this uh, KD defense, and did a, they've done this you know, repetitively here in this football game with turnovers, and those turnovers turn into points. It's none less than Cal Varner here taking that interception for a touchdown. Huge day for this KD defense. To your point, Gary, in the second half, uh, KD has scored 27 points, and uh, six have come from the uh, special teams, seven from the offense, and 14 from the defense. <laughs> there you go. That's complimentary football, it, isn't it? It really does. It works out very well, especially if you're Coach Joseph. <laughs> and you're, uh, you're, you're pleased with that effort. One yard gain on the plate and bring up second down. And uh, You know what? I did call, talk to Coach, Coach Joseph, we did, about, about keys. I, I mentioned the first one, can't get a, sep get a letter of separation. Two other things he mentioned. Tackling, they've done great on that. And third, pressure the quarterback. So I think they've kind of marked uh, check the a checkbox on pretty much all of those things here today. They've done an exceptional job of tackling in space, which is where you get explosive plays happening because these athletes that Cedar Hill has can turn a, a short play and a missed tackle into a huge gain. That hasn't happened against Katie for, for the most part of, of the afternoon. And then they've done a great job of, of, of turning limiting things in front of them and keep them to, to short gains. One yard carry for Chris Allen. They'll try now a throwback, but trouble. And this will not get going. Dwayne Blanton was trying to go back to Salter on a pass. The yeah, play he, loses seven yards. And he was covered anyway because Shepard Bowling was right there taking the quarterback out of the pocket. And that's why he never threw the football. It was not going to be an open receiver at all. So third down, kind of a misdirection and trying to do a throwback play for a first down. Never even got going. Another punt coming from Jaden Cardell. And there was some movement. Cost Cedar Hill five more yards. Ball start. Offense number 80. Five-yard penalty, main fourth down. It's been a tough afternoon for Carlos. And we said, uh, mentioned uh, Ordain, I said minister, it's Ordain Deacon. Yeah. Yes, Deacon, definitely a Deacon. I, I misspoke there. And that uh, he uses that to, to hit to great advantage and really is an opportunity to, to shape the lives of young men and bring uh, bring some, you know, some, some opportunities to communicate and understand of how and why people do things. And he's a great mentor. He's made quite the impact on this program, the school, today's result notwithstanding. Done a tremendous job at Cedar Hill. Line drive punt, and it'll roll out of bounds around the 45-yard line. So, 38-yard punt. Katie will get the ball back with 7.55 to go. Just that much time separating the Tigers from their ninth state football championship. Katie up 51-14 here early in the final quarter. In 2005, Katie and South Lake Carroll meeting yet again. Of course, Katie had beaten Carroll in 2003, but on this day, Greg McElroy showed that he was a fine replacement for the departed Chase Daniel. Found Corbin Smider deep, 47-yard score. Andy Dalton, a future NFLer, had a tough day. That interception, one of four picks by the Dragon defense. Carroll went on to beat Katie, 34 to 20. Katie had beaten Carroll 16-15 under Gary Joseph back in 2003. Speaking of that uh, quarterback of that Katie Tiger team, Lauren Blackwell, a little more illumination on that. 
the Tigers got a special visit from that former Katy Tiger. Dallas Cowboys quarterback Andy Dalton joined them at breakfast this morning to talk about his career path and overcoming obstacles. He encouraged these boys to step it up today, play their best. A member from the Katy Athletic Department told me a number of the members of the athletic department coached Andy back in the day. They said he is still 100% Katy through and through, proud of his town and this program. So it's really great to see him involved with this team as much as he is. Yeah, Andy's done a great job as far as staying in contact with that program, talking to those kids and bringing a little bit of the history to them and, and understanding, you know, it's all about Katie football, but uh, Andy's had a tremendous career as a draft pick by the Cincinnati Bengals, three-time Pro Bowler and done a great job to 2011 to 2019 with the Bengals and now with America's team, the Dallas Cowboys, played quarterback with the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, kind of an exciting career for, for a former Katie quarterback, Andy Dalton, Kind of living the dream, don't you think, Craig? Absolutely. And it, enjoying what he's seeing today, no doubt about that. A run for Jalen Davis. A gain of nine on first down. These Davis brothers have been so solid today for Katie. And one of the things about Andy, he had a great career at TCU, not too far from here as well. And people here in the Metroplex, they certainly know a lot about Andy Dalton and his career with the, with the, with the Horn Frogs. Tigers certainly content to take their time before going to the line of scrimmage. And back to the ground this time, it's Aiden McKinney, the senior fullback. Another move of the chains in a first down. We saw it. South Lake Carroll beating Katie that time. How about the Dragons in the state championship against the Westlake Chaparrales? Yes, they're calling it the Dodge Bowl. Dodge Ball on display. Westlake head coach Todd Dodgers won five state championships, including last year's 6A Division II title at Westlake. Now looking for a 6A Division I crown against the school that he coached to so much glory. A 79-1 mark over the course of five years. The Carroll Dragons coached by his son, Riley Dodge. <laughs> All kinds of intrigue to that one yeah, tonight at seven. A lot of family affair in that ball game tonight. You know, it's got to be just a great feeling for Todd Dodge and Riley Dodge, one to compete against each other. You know, they, they've had tremendous history and they're kind of a first family of of, uh, of, of football in Texas and you know, with the spread offense that they've created and, and brought birth throughout the state of Texas. And it's just been tremendous. I, that, that's going to be a great, fun ball game tonight to watch. Well, uh, Riley's grandfather, of course, was the uh, the great Ebby Neptune, who was a, a, one of the founding fathers of Westlake football coach, later athletic director, and Gary Joseph coached under Ebby Neptune there. It was a surge straight ahead, another first down for Katie, a five-yard game. So Tigers... Now we'll see the youngsters come in as uh, those starters get their curtain call and a chance to come out here. Starting offensive line did a tremendous job all day long. They certainly have. They should be commended and they've done a great job all season long. They have uh, you know, held the torch and held it high for that offensive line. OLH is alive and well at Katy High School. the carry a short gain there for Jaden Rodriguez. Bryce Neerider is in at quarterback. The junior for uh, Katie. As Gary Joseph has made his substitutions. So that'll be at 7 o'clock tonight. The 6A Division I State Championship. Westlake, Southlake Carroll. Carroll's first appearance in the title round. In nine years, the 2011 state championship, which they won over Fort Ben Hightower here back in 2011. To the ground again. And another carry by Rodriguez. Bring it up third down as Katie continues to run the clock now. Corey Trailer, a senior defensive end on the stop for Cedar Hill. You know, kind of in line with uh, the history of quarterbacks that. Uh, at Katie, in addition, Andy Dalton, Bo Levi Mitchell still still at it. He's still playing Canadian ball. He didn't have a season this year because of uh, COVID-19 and the Canadian Football League, but he's still definitely part of uh, that program in Calgary, the Stampeders. And remember, he took the 
state title, 16 and 0 in 2007. State championship team for Katie. So Bo Levi Mitchell definitely uh, a big part of the legacy as well of uh, Katie football. Think of all those guys, Garrett Doron, another yep. guy who was uh, quarterback during the, the big battles they had with Cedar Hill. Katie's had, you know, very fine quarterback play, and they got fine quarterback play from their sophomore today, Caleb Coker. Yeah, and I think he's grown up quite a bit throughout the season. And I, I love the way that Coach Joseph has managed him throughout the season. And that what that does, it, don't put everything on him. You've got to have other players around you to pick up a young player. He's a sophomore quarterback. And, Craig, you, you used this, this word earlier as we see the field goal. Oh, that was a miss there as Logic was going for a record. That one from 39, he hit for 48, but could not get that to go. And so, and uh, that was actually not uh, Logic who kicked it. So that would might make a little more sense there on the drive because Gary Joseph is completely empty the bench. It was Axel Robertson who tried that one. It didn't go through, but it's of little consequence at this point in the football game. Well, speaking of points here with 51 on the board from Katie, that's uh, right now in a 6A championship. It's the second most behind Allen's 63 against Pearland, of course, in the largest division, which used to be 5A. There's a couple of other big totals in there, but in terms of 6A, it is the second highest point total in school history or in uh, UIL 6A history as Kylan Ashton carries it back. There's a 1996 Louisville 5A Division I state championship team that beat Converse Judson 58-34. And the uh, Fighting Farmers that day had 501 yards of total offense all on the ground running the wishbone <laughs> all that stuff it's all kind of that and you know for all these players congratulations are going to be going to be held here with uh, with katie winning the state championship and you know the experience of playing in this stadium it's unique and it's good to see that uh, both these these teams have brought big rosters they brought all looks like a lot of their some of their their sub varsity players here to this game to get the experience when i'm looking at this field here i see a you know a plethora of of katie tigers there must have been about 10 buses it looks like <laughs> for for that trip to come up here from, from from the houston area and you know across the field we also see cedar hill and a great group of young men over there as, as you take take a look at the, the the group of players here with with them so the experience of being here is life lasting, Craig? You know, and this is something that both these teams, you know, win or loss, they have a great experience of competition here, and that's what the UIL is all about. No question. And despite the disappointment for Cedar Hill, they're going to have great memories of a year that got them all the way to the state championship as Cedric Harden Jr. carries the ball. So it is fourth down. We mentioned Katie coming from the greater Houston area off that west side of Harris County. And uh, it's grown quite a bit. <laughs> yes, it has. <laughs> Over time. And found it all the way back in 1898. Yeah, that is the Oscar winner, wow. uh, Renee Zellweger, from there. How about that punt? This may be a record punt. Yeah, boy, that's tremendous. That'll roll all the way down to the eight-yard line. That's a 65-yard punt. <laughs> Here with 109 to go. Just let one rip. There you go. Good job. Cardell with a huge effort there. And the ball was pretty off his foot. It was a spiral, Craig. I like those. It's a memory he'll have to take with him. Yes, indeed. He didn't hit the scoreboard, though. That's it was close, but he didn't <laughs> hit the scoreboard. So Katie prepares to uh, run out the clock and claim the school's ninth state championship. You see the uh, hugs being shared all the way around. The happiness on the face of uh, Gary Joseph. Well, what a, what, a, what a storied coaching career that he's had, Craig. And, you know, when you look at bios of coaches and when we look at his bio, I mean, it's pages. It is literally pages of the excellence that he has had in his career as a coach with all of the accolades. I can't even go through them, but 
but to be the mentor and, and, and leader of young men is his is his lasting legacy and I'm sure he would agree that uh, being able to to teach youth and young young players about about sport about life is really the joy of being a being a football coach and and I'm sure he's, he that that would be the same sentiment with every football coach that's out there is being able to be impactful in, in the in the lives of young people. Ivy Bell had the carry there. Katie is taking the timeout, and the reason for this is, and you talked about time it, out. Gary. Katie, it's their second and a half. The reason that they took this timeout is all the busloads of the kids came up. Gary Joseph is bound to determine to get every single kid he can on the field before this thing is done and let them experience being able to play in a state championship. Yeah, if you didn't get a snap in this game, let me know. We're going to get you out there because it's it's a little bit of a, a management situation here that you don't necessarily have the opportunity to get everybody in. And it's it's a lot of guys over there. And uh, hopefully they've all got a, had a chance. Well, I'll tell you one guy who had a chance today. Boy, did he contribute. Our Jack of the Box player of the game, the sophomore, Seth Davis. Now, well, Seth Davis has had a nice day. And you see his speed and quickness and you know, the offensive line have opened up some great holes for him and his brother. But Seth has done a good job of just taking his opportunity, and he's weaved through the off the, of the defensive backfield and got him a touchdown in this ball game. So uh, look at the numbers there on him. Almost 10 yards per carry there. Eight, well, eight plus, almost nine yards per carry. Good job on the afternoon for him. Getting a look at the future of him, the future of the KD Tiger program. But the present reveals... A ninth state championship for the Tigers. Gary Joseph and his group, lots of congratulations and well-earned because the Tigers are going to celebrate the school's ninth state championship. Katie will take that bus ride back down to the west side of Harris County as 6A Division II state football champions. So many things were different and changed and unusual and unprecedented and several other descriptions like that. Several others have been like that, but there have been some constants. And one of those constants has been the excellence of the Katy Tiger football program. Great show of sportsmanship there as Gary Joseph and Carlos Lynn exchanging the greetings after the game. But uh, Katy, past, present, and headed in the future still as one of the top flight programs in all of Texas high school football. Yeah, they had an occasion that happened this year. They lost a district game, the first in 12 years. And coach talked to us about using that as a motivation point, a refocus point to propel them to finish a strong, strong end of their season. And it has wound up here in Arlington with Katie being the 6A D2 state champions. This might be the most creative state championship team photo that we <laughs> will have seen with, uh, might have to take a look, look at this with the, with the sky cam up there. But the state sign, huh? Yeah, the uh, state champs banner being unveiled there as uh, the Tigers. Look at the, the, look at the overhead board, Craig. It looks pretty cool up there. Yeah. The Jerry Tron up here. Plenty of reason to celebrate. Let's go down to the field to Lauren Blackwell. Well, Coach, in a challenging season, a very long season, your team is taking home its ninth state title in program history. How does it feel to overcome those obstacles all year to get to this point? It's awesome. It speaks so highly of our kids and our coaches, our administration that's helped us get through this pandemic. You know, it's a whole thing. It's not just... You know, the Katy football, it's, it's the drill team, the band. Everybody got to sit there and enjoy this and be a part of it. I'm so proud of Katy. Jalen and Seth, you're one-two punch on offense, but a number of players with scores in this win. How truly potent is that offense with so many capable guys? Well, you know, we got better all year long, and, you know, and that, that's the objective. And, you know, that was one, my objective after we lost the ball game. As I told them, we lost the district game in 2008 and turned around and won a state championship. And I told them it was possible, but they had to sit there and roll their sleeves up and go to work. And uh, those kids did, and they do, they're responding great after that. 
Coach, you said at the half how well your team was playing and how unselfish they've played. Can you speak to their unselfishness all well, season? Well, that's that's why we're, you know, play the defense we do is because each one of them understands they have a job and they have a role and, and it, it all fits together. It's not, not about an individual. It's about a team and, and, and a team sitting there playing together as a group. Coach, congratulations on an incredible season, an incredible win. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Craig. Thank you, Thank you Lauren. And... Uh, spoke of it said they all committed to the, yeah. to the to the plan you know he is he is the epitome of a football coach and he just does it all for the right reasons he just wants to bring everybody together the whole community he wants all of them to share into it and that's what texas high school football is all about all communities coming together and, and enjoying it in a in a celebration in a championship and and it's it, it is tremendous when it happens certainly disappointment for caden salter and the cedar hill Longhorns. they hope to win the state title again but we're always at this point where we discuss the fact that the disappointment is there, but the memories will remain of a great season, which they will appreciate more in time. It's time now for the presentation of the UIL State Championship MVP Awards. Let's go down to the field. His 10-year NFL veteran, Bobby Taylor. He was an all-pro defensive back with the Philadelphia Eagles after being named All-American at Notre Dame and an All-State at Longview High School. And now for the defensive player of the game for the Conference 6A Division II Football State Championship from Katy High School, number 91, Cal Varner. For the offensive player of the game for the 6A Division II Football State Championship from Katy High School, number 23, Seth Davis. Big six for the touchdown defensive MVP, Seth Davis, 123 rushing yards, our Jack in the Box player of the game. Also, the offensive MVP of the state championship is voted on the by the media here at AT&T Stadium in Arlington. Now for the presentation of the state finalist trophy to Cedar Hill. That will happen first, followed by the UIL 6A Division II state championship trophy to, to Katie, but first, the state finalist trophy to Cedar Hill. Runner-up trophy, completing the season with a 12-2 record. The Longhorns of Cedar Hill High School have represented their school in pride. Coach Carlos Lynn will now accept the state finalist trophy. We congratulate the Longhorns of Cedar Hill on an outstanding season. We would like to recognize the 6A Division II football state champ, the Tigers of Katy High School. With a record of 14-1, Coach Gary Joseph and his team have achieved the goal of becoming Texas High School state champs. Congratulations on an incredible season. And once again, your 6A Division II state football champs, the Tigers of Katy High School. That triumphant moment for Gary Joseph and his seniors, his captains, his team. The Katy Tigers claiming the 6A Division II state championship. Uh, give that trophy to those players and get out of the way. That's what Coach Joseph does, and he knows it's all about the players, and it's a great special moment for those young men. They'll it's going to last the rest of their lives. This is something that you can never take away from you being a champion. It's, it's tremendous. We have more coming up from AT&T Stadium in Arlington. Katie winning the 6A Division II state title. The Katie Tigers celebrating 
the 6A Division II State Football Championship. So we continue with our post-game coverage from here inside AT&T Stadium in Arlington. Greg Wayne and Gary Reasons. And let's go back down the field. Our Katie Engelson with one of those Davis brothers. Katie? Thank you, Craig. Jalen, congratulations. An emphatic performance to put an exclamation mark on a season unlike any other. How do you put into words this win? Uh, just all worth it. it. It was all worth it from the, from sack camp, summer camp. Every little thing we've done, all four years I've been here, I just, I'm blessed to play play with this, this community. You were so dominant in that run game. What were you seeing in regards to Cedar Hill's defense that allowed you to be so productive? I just seen they, they're a fast team. Those guys got athletes. They like to flow hard, and, and our scheme was just to make them keep flowing and keep running hard, and that's what we stuck to. This was such an unprecedented year. What can be said of your team's determination and focus to get to this point and win a state title? I mean, the, the, the year wasn't easy. Corona, all that, we never knew if we were going to play. Uh, we all did it for Coach Joseph, really. Coach Joseph, the, I wouldn't want to play for anybody else. He's a, he's a great coach, great leader, great role model, and, and, and the coaching staff. I, I love this team. So sharing this experience with your little brother, Seth, how do you put into words what this experience and how special this was for you? It's just, it's just a blessing. Uh, we've been through a lot, and and, and I, I'm just blessed to play with him and, and, and be a, kind of a role model and... You, you don't see this all the time, so I thank God. I thank God, number one. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Greg. Thank you, Katie. And yeah, that's the older brother saying he feels blessed to be able to share that moment with his younger brother, Seth, who was named the offensive MVP and, of course, our uh, Jack of the Box player of the game as we uh, continue with the post-game coverage here. You know, uh, Gary, going into this state championship game the, the the roster is pretty impressive when you look down the list of the teams that have won state championships and the total number of state titles garnered through the years of course alito winning its 10th overall record 10th state championship yesterday and so here was katie going into it with eight and really just attacked this thing from the start well they had a great game plan they had great execution early on they had a, they had a, a team that just kind of willed themselves to win and, and it really just showed that they were prepared today i think the offense really took control of this football game for katie and they never looked back as a result they're number nine now nine state championships for the KD Tigers, second all time to Alito and most in the state's highest classification, 6A. Let's go back down to the field, check in with Lauren Blackwell. Thanks, Craig. I'm joined by Seth Davis, offensive MVP. Seth, 123 rushing yards today. What made you so successful on that field this afternoon? Well, I give it all to my O-line. Without my O-line, I can't do nothing. They, they kept pounding their D-line and we end up scoring and winning the game. This has been such a crazy season, a season we didn't even know might might happen or not. How is your team able to overcome all the obstacles and challenges this season and pull out a state title? Yeah, COVID was, it was a, that was a big obstacle, but we overcame it. We uh, shortened our group. We stopped hanging out with everyone so we could all get it. And then, yeah, we just worked hard at practice every single day. A few minutes ago, your older brother, Jalen, told us he feels blessed to be on the field with his younger brother. Can you talk about your relationship and what this season has been like playing uh -huh. with Jalen? Yeah, my brother is a big mentor for me. I learned everything from my brother. I couldn't do anything without my brother, and I love him, and I'm so glad I got the opportunity to win it with him. You have a few more years left in a KD uniform. Your brother's a senior. He just wrapped up his season. A lot of these other seniors are mentors to you as well. What was this senior class like, and what's it going to be like the next few yeah. years without them? Yeah, I'm going to miss this senior class. This is the best senior class. They welcomed me to varsity. I wasn't, I wasn't supposed to be on varsity, but I ended up getting moved up to it. And then my, they, the seniors helped me out so much, and I can I can thank them. Seth, congratulations on a wonderful season. Thank you. Craig. All right, thanks. He said, I wasn't supposed to be on varsity. Could have fooled me with what he did out there. Yeah, with all the talent that that young man displayed today, it was pretty evident that he needed to be out there and deserved to be there. He and his brother, you know, we talked about it at the beginning of the show, Craig. They set the table for this football team, over 3,000 yards combined rushing. And when you have a rushing attack that can do that, it puts a lot of pressure on defenses. And they kind of did everything that they needed to do in this football game and throughout the entire season. And then on the other side, their defense kept the pressure on Caden Salter and Cedar Hill throughout the course of the It was the day. a great defensive effort by Katie in this football game, being able to pressure that quarterback and, you know, he did not have an ability to really do what he does best, and that is kind of distribute the football. And Salter kind of took it on his shoulders and unfortunately didn't have his running mate back there in the running back game. 
Kevin was hurt. He, he got hurt over the in the eighth game of the, of the year. But, you know, they did what they could. They used some wide receivers, and it just wasn't enough to go against a very powerful and, you know, I, I guess probably the best team in, in the Katy Tigers. Katy Tigers winning their ninth overall state football championship. So it's down to one game remaining for all of Texas high school football. That's coming up tonight. The Dodge Bowl, Westlake, Southlake, Carroll at 7 o'clock. For Gary Reasons, for Katie Engelson, Lauren Blackwell, and our entire crew, I'm Craig Wade. Thanks for joining us. Katie, your 6A Division II state champions.